started, I will uh, take the offense to the fact that Um, I won't take any offense to the fact that everybody kind of moved off the first couple of rows. Is this even on when I took there? Uh, so that's all right. That really hurt my feelings. I'll get over it. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I hope everybody got to get a good night's rest. We're going to continue and finish this overview of the philosophy of ministry. We're going to revisit this, uh, this thing over here. By the way, this drawing is re-pictured for you. Uh, again, in case you missed it on that uh, first day, the Monday outlines. I do not have an outline on the Tuesday outline because my outline is still uh, is there on um, yes on that front page there. I just let you know sort of where we are. Um, okay, I would love to hear from you again. Uh, yesterday, I wanted to get you to start to think about how you understood and contemplated uh, your uh, ministry uh, and, and how you looked at it uh, in terms of the things that they valued, the things that they harped on. Um, different question this morning. I want you to think in terms this morning more of the kinds of things uh, that really would make ministry happen in your context. Okay. For a second, let's let's assume that we are all in the safety tree, uh, meaning uh, you know no one's going to talk outside this room. And there's no title failing about various and sundry churches. But um, I'd love to hear what you think. Um, your church could do. I'm talking about the church in which you serve. Let's take your youth group out of it uh, for the second. Uh, but what your church could do to better be an outreach to your community. Does that make sense? In other words, if there's going to be a better... Let me ask it this way. What would a church that was in your community and was really meeting the spiritual needs of that community look like? Or what would they do differently than what um, um, your, your church is doing now? Or what is your church doing now that perfectly suits the needs of, the needs of that community? you understand my question? What could your church be doing that would better help them to really meet the spiritual needs of that community as you see them? What you got? self-reflection about my context. Here we go. Yeah. 
but we have, but they're also not incorporated into the church. It's like, there's the church and then there's our ESL folks. Huh. But there's not, there's, and there's, it's like, there's some very small things that are starting to be incorporated, but it's, but it, but it's still seen as like, we have ESL Sunday school classes. Yes, yes the, the, the ministry's gone wild. You start something, it's so great because a big old mass of people show up, but no one has any idea how that thing fits into the larger ministry of the church. You know, I felt that way about the youth group ever. In other words, it's amazing how much frustration can be introduced into the life of the church when the individual work of that church doesn't have we don't know how this arm over here is feeding the central focus. A, because we don't even know what our central focus is. Uh, B, uh, it's no one's been explained to us. We've never been talked about it, talked about it. And what's worse is when you have something that works or something that blows up, uh, you get a really dynamic youth communicator in there, as every one of these people in this room uh, is, right? Or all of those people. Um, you get somebody in there who can really do it well, builds a big group of people, and we all walk around just go like, And yet, for some inexplicable reasons, tensions are rising all through the leadership of that organization. Why? Because nobody sat down and thought about how, why, and to what end the youth group is serving the rest of the church. So somebody's going to get ticked off, inevitably. And when they get ticked off, it'll be a quick breaking point. Your fuse is very short when you're in a ministry like that. Because if you don't have anything back of why you're there, it's, it's, they're all thin strings. And if somebody clips one, it feels really insecure. And you get a lot of people who get really mad really quick and get really gone. So you have the average length of a youth pastor stay. This goes up and down every time I read this research. But it's somewhere between like uh, 9 and 14 months. The average stay for a youth pastor. Um, why? Because we've not figured out how to incorporate that into the rest of the life of the church. And a big part of what I want to talk about this morning. Good, good one. Uh, whether it's ESL or youth group or bargains. Good, what else? It's very long time. I'm interesting. I'm interested. Yes. <laughs> That's pressure, isn't it? Be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there's one thing that characterized my community is when we moved in. It was, um, this is a great place to raise a family. We heard that over and over again. This is a great place to have children and raise a family. And our church really embodies that. Um, I think we need to be, we need to find creative ways to push people out of their nets a little bit. Um, it's a very myopic, like, mindset. And it's not necessarily bad. I'm glad there's folks on the family. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just kind of insular. Sure, sure. Well, look, it's interesting when an identity sort of takes over, and the idea behind the identity was so that we could have a place for people two, dot, dot, dot. It really feels like once you've achieved that, you don't have any place to go. Or, all you have to do is stick around for about 10 years. This is one of the very interesting things that I feel like I'm able to see even at age 46, is to watch a church age with its pastor. Because I kind of found a group of people that are sort of like me and, and connect with me and, oh, I've got kids in grade school. Oh, I've got kids in high school. Oh, yeah, all my kids are off to college. And the pastor tends to relate to that sort of thing. And it's amazing how often the church struggles when it ages with the pastor um, with some of these growth things. That, once again, feelings start getting hurt. That's another great question. How do you extend ministry out across time once your ministry has, maybe even very well, found a niche? Because life is too fluid and dynamic <laughs> to maintain that niche. It's just going to change. This might have been a great thing for five years, but is that really what we're planning this church for? You know, we want to, you know, we're going for you know, 2018. Once we get there, you know, woo, we'll arrive. And you blink, it's the year 2018, and we're all like, what are we doing? I'll never forget how much life changed when uh, a guy who you know, actually speaks here our way often came to me and said, you know, Les, we're not interested in you doing your work for RUF's ministry at the University of Memphis so that you can be there for five years. 
We want you to do your work so that thing will be there in 50 years. Now, I don't think I can adequately describe what a radical shift that was for me. You start thinking very different when you realize, I'm not just here for the four years of this kid to get from ninth grade to 12th grade. It's not why I'm here. If you step back and say, I'm going to serve this kid through their lifetime, that changes you. For instance, it changes your sense of patience. I think there's a lot of anxiety that youth pastors feel because of a need to produce, because of a need to sort of uh, create energy. A lot of anxiety youth pastors feel and wanting to get somebody where they want to get them. When the truth is, and a whole lot of pressure too, because there's no more insecure person in the world than a parent of a teenager. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that they've ever had to deal with this. You know, especially the oldest child. When that oldest child is going through that phase of high school, this is the parent's first time to go through that too. You know, why is every oldest child a perfectionist? Because all of their parents overparented. If they, were, if they were conscientious people, they overparented because the stage was always new to them. No matter where Anna Grace goes, it will always be the first time her mother and I have ever dealt with it. You know, she's my oldest, she's my 14th. She's a perfectionist. Why? Because we've overparented. We've ruined her in that way. We apologize for her forever when she's sitting up doing her homework, you know, past bedtime. Sweetheart, put it away. I still feel like I know it. Great. Your mother and father apologized to you because we did this to you. <laughs> but I promise you, you're going to be okay if you make a 96 and not 100. You're going to be all right. So, you see, that's kind of like a humble brag that you throw at me like, and she makes really good grades too. I really, I really do believe that it's, a, it's bad for her. Um, so, the question is, how different would it be if I looked and saw, my goal is not to get just through this time. There's times in which I've got to do that. But do I have a 50-year plan? to have an idea of what this youth group would look like in 50 years? Obviously, they're not the same people, but what does that mean? So longevity can also adjust uh, those expectations. You see all these factors coming in? Um, I, I, I spent too much time on this yesterday, so I don't want to get sort of uh, distracted by today. Um, so let me ask you this question. How about your youth group? Let's go from the macro to the micro here of your group. Answer the same question with your youth group. What's the one thing that your youth group could change in the spring of 2014 that would make it a place that really met the spiritual needs of the youth with whom you have natural contact? What's the one change that you think needs to be made? And this could be a miraculous change. It could be a, you know, God will have to come down in the flesh uh, to change the dynamic of my church or something like that. What you got? Now we're all going to get personal. What's the one thing that you wish would change? What's the one thing that you resent the most? I wish I had to support the uh, session. Gotcha. When you Flesh out the word support. I feel alienated like you were talking earlier. <coughs> the church session the pastor, they expect the youth to run the EDS. They expect the youth to do all the community outreach. They expect the youth to do mission trips. They expect the youth to do everything. Oh, and you know, the, the, the nice people that have lots of money, they'll, they'll give you all the money in the world, but they won't go with you. I'd like to talk to those people. <laughs> but so I, I, and, and I've cried out for support, you know, from, from the adults. I just can't get them to, to come alongside the youth. I can't even get them to come on Wednesday nights to have dialogue and discussion. Because I know that, I mean, I'm, I'm almost 40, so I've experienced a lot of things, but I've got people in their 50s and 60s that yeah, they, our youth need that. They need to hear the tribulation and the trial that they don't do the I was on I was on a conference call Friday, as a matter of fact, with a guy who was being interviewed for a job. And one of the interview interviewers on the conference call asked the guy a question about um, um, engaging local pastors in an area and drawing them in and helping them to own this particular ministry that he was interviewed for. Argue about the ministry. And it was funny, at one point he said, You know, if I've learned anything, this was an experienced uh, campus minister. He said, If I've learned anything, you know, um, I've learned 
that it really isn't rocket science to make someone feel like you're including them in what you do. It's like it's not it's not mis it's not mysterious. Um, show up twice a year. <laughs> you know, have a meeting with me twice a semester. Um, the, the simple things that you look about being engaged are not rocket science. But what happens is, again, in church lives and, and youth work especially, is we get myopia over my little territory and we don't know how it connects with the larger whole. That get deeply frustrated. And it all of a sudden means that you get a lot of people that are overworked, who are doing stuff that's not their job. I'm planning the missions trip? Huh, I didn't see that on the job description. Let me tell you the worst thing you can possibly hear from a search committee. Some of you are going to be interviewing for jobs. Maybe this won't be the last job that you have. If a search committee looks at you and says, honestly, we think you're so gifted and talented, we're going to let you write your own job description. <laughs> That's a fast way to be burned out in about 18 months. Because what that means is, anything that we can think of that is a good thing for a church to do, we're going to let you do it and organize it and let you know we expect you to do it. That is death to you. We have what we call a job description, right? And if someone changes that job description, we can go to the session and be like, did y'all change this? Because there's a lot of stuff that you're asking me to do that's not on this paper. And so if that's the case, then I expect to be compensated for it. <laughs> it took you a second. It took you a second. You thought, is that funny? This one. Um, what else? One more.
we've said the purpose of ROI is to reach high school students for Christ, high school junior high students for Christ, and equip them to serve. Reaching and equipping is the heart of our purpose. When we say reaching, we are engaging students with the message of the cross. We long for them to interact with the gospel as it comes to us in Scripture. I'm, in, I'm owning the fact that there are some theological distinctives that I just threw out there in those statements. Not the least of which is, I think the Bible is about the cross. It's about Jesus. This is Jesus' conversation that he has at the very end of the book of Luke with the disciples on the road to Maze. He opened up the Scripture and he showed them everything that the, the Scriptures testified about himself. The world's greatest small group that everyone in this room wishes they could have sat in on. Don't you wish you could have sat there and let Jesus take you through the Old Testament and show you where everything should talk about him? Um, but that's what we mean when we talk about reaching students for Christ. We talk about their relationship to the cross. They can either be converted or they cannot be converted. But we also talk about equipping those students. The purpose of RYM is to train you on how to equip students. When we think about equipping, we do not mean a nebulous, um, individualized discipleship. You know, the word discipleship really did not make it into Christianese and sort of a, a, a Christian philosophies of ministry really until the last 70 to 90 years. It's the earliest that you start to see that concept as a phenomenon go, coming up among uh, youth pastors, well, what we really want to do is we want to do discipleship. We're all about a discipleship ministry. We really focus on discipleship. Well, that idea of discipleship from the earliest of ages, especially when you start to read the Puritans, is not wrapped up in what we typically do with discipleship. My students that are coming to RUF have a very monolithic view of discipleship. That is, it is me sitting across the table in a coffee shop for dinner, with the Bible open between us, and talking about the Bible. What does this verse mean to you? How can you apply this today? That is discipleship for them. Now, discipleship, I would not say, is less than that. That's not a bad thing to do. Please don't stop me one more than talking about the Bible with your students, please. That's a good thing. But what we mean in RYM is a much broader sense of equipping that can only be done by the entirety of the body of Christ. In other words, you measure someone's discipleship not simply by their, their gains and advances in dealing with personal sin, though that's part of it. We measure their discipleship by their involvement and their enfolding into the body of Christ. By virtue of Jesus' death and resurrection, they are brought in union with Christ. And the, what I tried to argue with you yesterday was the most tangible way that's going to happen is in the church. That horrible mess of you know, unmotivated session and the acting and whatever else you know, that we in all of our infinite wisdom can, are the only ones that can see. That's where Jesus wants us to serve. Of course it's messed up. It's been messed up since the book of Corinthians. Yes, everything's wrong about it. But that's why we say as we are reaching and equipping, we want to see people engaged with the cross in the church. Because that's what we mean by those two terms. And so yesterday what we did is we tried to break those terms out into a grid. Notice that the Pentagon is based upon the grid we created with these two, with these two purposes. Okay? So that there's an axis going this way. The top half are the kinds of students that I engage in who I really believe the cross has gotten a hold of. They have become converted. God, their heart has been changed. People on the bottom half, I'm not convinced of that. That's the, did I say vertical axis? This is a horizontal axis, is it not? Okay, good. Convex, concave, vertical, horizontal, it's okay, it's about what you want. Then you have the vertical axis, right? On this side are people that have actually come and gotten involved in your group. They go to your church. They're in the healthy life of the church. These people over here are those who have not. Maybe involved in another healthy church, but they're not in yours. They're not in your group. That's how you're thinking of it. So when you put them together, you create four quadrants of people. So back to my guy sitting on the front row being like, you know, 
Students don't like to be put in boxes. You can't put them in a box. Well, well, maybe they don't like that, but you always do it. As a matter of fact, you are doing it somehow. One of the things that we don't recognize when we're younger in youth ministry is we have categories on the inside that are cool and not cool. You ever had this? Where you sort of pine for the cool guys at the youth group, and you're kind of like, why is it that you don't like it's all cool people? And then you figure out why they get the cool people and you end up saying things like, us because they don't challenge them. They're really being challenged in here. In other words, suddenly the way in which your emotions are reacting show that you got some categories. So we look at you and say, you need to come here for a week, a year, at least a week, a year, and have someone remind you of what our categories really are. This is how we look at students. This is how we rearrange my instincts on the inside to evaluate them. You're already evaluating them on some scale. We're saying if you want to do RYM, it's going to come through this grid. Does that make sense? Or you're not doing RYM. This is the manner in which we're encouraging you to look at students. Why? Because if you're looking students here, you're owning our purpose. And I used the phrase core values and it threw you off a little bit. I'm basically saying the way in which we express our purpose is what happens here. Okay? So, how do we flesh out the rest of this? The way in which this whole thing works, and again, see the dotted line and show the, the uh, deals, is we break out these people into these four quadrants and then begin to think about what we do in meeting these needs. Before your week is over, I encourage every one of you to attempt this. You need to sit down with a list of the people in your youth group. Draw as many as you can get out on a page at one time. Get whether it's 5, 10, 30, 40, whatever. And place them along these points. And you can get very specific about this. Okay? Because the way in which the thing works, and if you go to the drawing, you'll see this. There's also a way to measure levels of resistance within each quadrant. What does that mean? Well, let's face it, there are certain individuals whom you are convinced are converted and they are a part of your youth group. But, and they have minimum resistance to what you're doing. These are your right-hand men or women. This is the faithful girl. She's there every time. She leads. She participates. There's no resistance from her. It's great. On the other hand is your kid who's plugged in but is one of the best athletes at their school. And they are deeply constricted because of time. They're converted. They're in your group. But there's a lot of resistance to dealing with, to, to working with them because of their schedule. Does that make sense? So you can actually measure along a bit of a grid for each quadrant whether someone is super available or whether it's going to cause us extra tension. Let me show you another one. Let's take down here the un an unconverted sort of, uh, or conversion growth quadrant. You have maximum and minimum resistance as well. In other words, a minimum resistance person to your outreach to them would be someone who, let's say, for instance, just lost a parent. They grew up in a pagan atmosphere. Their parent was stricken with cancer tragically while they were in high school or junior high. And they're facing this, uh, this whole thing. Um, that's minimum resistance because they're ready to ask the questions. I remember I was sitting in a car with Neil. That's actually his name. Neil was the sweetest kid in the world. This is 30 years ago, so it didn't really matter. Neil was the sweetest kid in the world. Oh, everything's great, everything's great. But in, in the space of one year, Neil lost a, one, his brother, his older brother, to suicide. He, um, his little sister had attempted suicide and failed. It was a bit of a attention uh, suicide, but it was suicide to nonetheless. And his parents now announced that they were getting a divorce largely due to the suicide of the oldest brother. So I'm sitting there chatting with Neil and, you know, how are you doing? It's great, it's great, that's kind of sad, but everything's great. And you think to yourself, you know, I'm no psychotherapist. I don't think everything's great. It's not great. You need to talk about this. This has nothing to do with the illustration. But he couldn't, uh, he could not function as long as I was asking him questions. He was this kid that I always gave rides home to. He lived like 30 seconds from and um, I found one night, inexplicably, I was like, hey, let's go get some ice cream. And he was like, 
Ah, I didn't bring any money. I was like, come on, pay for your ice cream. Uh, let's go. So we go to Baskin Robbins. Baskin Robbins everywhere. This is a universal thing. It's just, just a Memphis. Go to Baskin Robbins. And uh, I said, dude, you need to get whatever you want. And he was like, I've always looked at that hot fudge Sunday. It looks awesome. Hot fudge Sunday, get it. And so he would, and again, he's just shocked. He's going to buy me hot fudge Sunday. Um, this was before the day, so I thought, is he a pervert? Is that why he's bringing me ice cream? You could actually get away with this. So we got in the car, then he's got his ice cream Sunday. I think it's giant. And he starts working on this thing. And he is just going through it. All of a sudden, within like 30 seconds, he was like, you know, I don't know. I've been really sad about my brother. And, you know, I, honestly, my sister is just walking to the And I don't know what to do about my parents. He's just crying. Why is he up this ice cream? And I remember thinking, what the world is going on with the ice cream? Well, years later, I ended up going to this, I uh, think, a class at the seminary about emotional transference. That they'll say, a lot of times there's so much boiling on the inside of a broken person that they don't know what to do, to, to, to do with it. And if you continue just to help them from the outside, that's way too threatening. So what you get is, is their default mode, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's great. But once he had sort of something else to focus on, you know, the ice cream was able to collect his emotional anxiety, and suddenly he was able to come out. And he's bald and crying, which was not the goal, but at least we know he didn't. At least I could look at him and be like, well, we know now that things are not okay. And you know that's all right to say they're not okay. It's going to be we got to go talk to somebody. He saw a counselor. It worked out. All right, so he would be a minimum resistance person. Okay? A maximum resistance person is the girl who came on your youth retreat because she was friends with one of these great girls up here, uh, but she's Muslim. And her parents have said, you can do this as a study, but if you ever convert, you're out of this family. And she's in 10th grade. That's maximum resistance. And we, we, got, we, we watch how we map out some of our activities in reaching those people, but they're part of the equation. In other words, what the Pentagon becomes is a way for you to get a snapshot of your ministry in a very quick way that as you take the snapshot of your ministry, you can see whether you're remaining true to the core values of, of our, our YM's philosophy and ministry. That's what this is for. It's a purpose of giving a snapshot of knowing where am I? Because you get this every report you've got to do for the session. How's it going in the youth group? It's a great way to answer this. I'm going to be honest with you, I've been very interested that lately we've getting a lot of people that have been coming over from that church across town that's fallen apart. The youth director you know, had an affair, and we're picking up a lot of those folks. Wow, we've got transfer growth with minimal um, resistance. This is a dynamic, by the way. In future uh, RYM trainings, what is really helpful is to go through each of these four quadrants and talk about how ministry functions in each of these. There are dynamics that are true to every one of these quadrants. You instinctively have an idea of what the act of discipleship can and should look like. You should instinctively know that we don't necessarily target transfer growth. That's classless. Why does that show a lot of, why does that show a lack of class? What do we call that? Sheep stealing. Thank you. Sheep steal. They don't go after the people in the other youth group, especially if they're well plugged in over there. They can come to my activities or something, but I'm not going to target those people. That, that, that's how to ruin your reputation in the community. Conversion growth. What I oftentimes talk to about folks in youth groups is they are dominated by these people. They have no sense of this. And this snapshot of your ministry can really help you say, are we doing any outreach to people that don't know anything about Jesus or God? What would that look like? And then finally, with renewal growth, we suddenly realize that there's a lot that has to be done on the counseling side and dealing with folks that are all plugged in and I don't think they know Jesus. So there's dynamics that you form in here. And notice on the inside is what you're doing. What are you doing? You're doing large group Bible studies, worship type events, which have various uh, dynamics themselves that work in certain places. You have small groups that you're going to run and put together and keep active with. You can do one-on-one -on -one counseling with students. Conferences are a thing all by themselves. They function differently. And it's all built upon the foundation of the need to build leadership. Leadership development is a huge part of this. And RYM begins to train you to do all of these things while keeping in mind that this is how we look at students. And in just a minute, we're going to talk about how this is based upon our presuppositions. How it's based on our presuppositions. 
Okay? Jody asked me to spend some time on the Pentagon uh, uh, so that we can go back through that and have, have that be a, a grid that you're working through. Um, but what I want to move on to next, I tell you what, it's 9.35. We started at 9. We get two more minutes at this point. Um, let me go back to a thing. Is it okay if I erase this? Uh, yeah. Knock yourself out of here. You don't understand the first place, so erase it or keep it up, doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm not thinking about it ever again. So, uh, I fought this battle for years. I fought this battle for Chris Harper to campus. Okay, um, not against Chris Harper. You've loved the Pentagon, haven't you? Still trying to figure it out. Have you asked it inside, to, inside your heart and accepted it as your personal warm <laughs> Alright, let's go back to our, uh, our thing that we drew yesterday. Remember, we said theology leads to philosophy, which leads to methodology. Okay? But this is our thing. And the directional arrows have to go that way. They have to go in this direction. Why? Because if they go in this direction, and all of a sudden we begin to pattern our theology on the basis of what works, that's bad. You are a pragmatist if you do that. No, the arrow has to go this way. Our philosophy of ministry is meant to ensure that it goes this way. We don't do, we don't do things just because it works. We do it because it's true. We do it because it's what God says that we do. Right? Okay, so we're, I want to define it for the next couple minutes what we mean by our theology and our methodology. We spent all day yesterday talking about what we mean by this word. What do we mean by our theology? Um, well, I can state it very simply. We mean what we call the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, for those of you that are sort of uh, theologically uh, minimalistic uh, and out of the box thinkers, sometimes this really bugs youth directors. Oh, great. Here we go with a what? 350, 400 year old document written by a bunch of crusty old Englishmen from forever ago. Uh, and of course, if you're more learned about it, you're like, well, who were dominated by the scholasticism of the And you condescend to this whole idea that they would even be, why do you even need a confession of faith? Why in the world would, have you ever less tried to put, you know, the, the stilted language of the Westminster Confession in front of a junior high student? Blah. How boring. How boring. Well, guess what? It's your job to keep that from being boring. Look, I'm not defensive about the Westminster Confession, even though I ain't budging from it either. Um, for this reason, uh, we talked yesterday, and I've still been mulling over Jonathan's, Jonathan? Jonathan's question, um, about, you know, uh, students that sort of, youth ministries that live with this philosophy. Um, one of the things that I think also uh, does not serve this generation of youth is the idea that comes from church people that, well, you know, we may not have all agreement in theological matters, but we, we agree on the important things, and so let's not spend too much time talking about theology. There was an instinct, there is an instinct, and largely due to the fact that when that kid goes to high school, Let's say they've got a secular high school teacher, which doesn't happen that often, even though it's a, it's a, it's a, they're out there. But more often than not, it's from another student who's like, you go to church? <laughs> no, I don't. Why would I? That's their gifts are into that thing. And suddenly you mix up all that acceptance and insecurity stuff into the religious question. And suddenly what Christian students do, people who would go to youth group, start thinking to themselves, what a waste of time. Why are we talking about theology? This is a terrible idea. Um, we actually are kind of unashamed of it in RYM. We're unashamed to say, you know what, we think that your problem is not that you've had too much theology. We think that your problem is, is that, is that you think that people don't have one. And the thinking that they don't have one makes you think that there is this kind of neutrality out there about religious things. And all it's done is make you more insecure about who you are spiritually. The very reason why these old, you know, Westminster divines 
come and spend all the time that they spent in London during those years while they were framing the confession, during those months, is because they wanted to give something that would be of benefit to the souls of their people. And what was that benefit? That benefit was a very rigid, scripture-based, theological scaffolding of the highest grade steel that would be able to last throughout a lifetime of their conviction. Our theology, the confession, is the, it is the very high steel that you give to your young people to help them build a lifetime of stability. It's stability to be able to have these categories. It keeps me from freaking out when I know the message of the gospel as more clearly than I typically do. To what do my memories turn when I begin to ask myself the question, do I really believe all this? Part of my mission is that I am trying to get people to embrace and understand the truths contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay? So broadly speaking, that's how we help to talk about our theology. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, get grief. So now we're going to take a class in the Westminster Confession. Is that the next thing? Is that the next thing? Because I never understand that thing. Honestly, it's a bunch of stilted language. I don't understand it. It was written 350 years ago. It, now I've got to take another class. By the time I even figure out what it's saying, I'll never figure out how to translate it to, to young people. Ah, oh, well, have no fear. We actually agree with you on this. You are ministering to something unique. You are not the head pastor of your church, assuming. You are at your people in a parenthesis of their lives that we call their teenage years. You meet them at a parenthesis, so you are there for a space of time. Recognizing that fact, therefore, we begin to ask the question about what do we believe about theology in a narrow sense? Bear with me here. These are what we call RYM's principles. Okay? What are the principles? The principles are concepts that need to be understood and committed to. I know that ended the sentence in a preposition. Uh, the principles are concepts that need to be agreed upon and um, uh, committed to. That's how we define what the principles are. In other words, they are a way for us to say, I only have these kids for a window, so can you help me with the big ones? Can you help me with the ones that you would say are so central to their spiritual formation that from that they can begin to build out a lifetime of appreciation for other concepts? You follow me? In other words, there's a sense in which it's the theological starting points that RYM is trying to give to you and for us to rally around and develop a language for so that we can impact students in this way. Now, there is no way that you are not going to say to yourself, why did you choose those three things? There are three principles. Three principles in RYM. Why did you choose those three? Couldn't you choose blah, blah, blah? What if you, well, how come you don't have blah, blah, blah? Okay. Look, there's probably a number of different ways in which to express the principles. And there, there might be four. I think three works for a number of different reasons I'm getting ready to show you uh, that I think help tremendously. And I think it stood the test of time for setting someone on a trajectory that both encompasses their spiritual thinking as well as, the, as well as their spiritual behavior. It encompasses the foundational needs for truth, but it encompasses the need to apply that truth to their daily lives. I'm a very big fan of the principles. Less, we're on the edge of our seats. Please tell us what the principles are. We are, we are just, our mouths are agape with anticipation. It goes a whole lot easier if you'll just like snicker out loud. <laughs> but, but, but thank you, thank you. Gratuitous laughter is always appreciated uh, in these contexts. Scripture, justification, and sanctification.
These are our three principles. I want to camp out on these for just a second. Um, again, it's okay for you to look and say, well, you know, listen, my vast theologically trained mind, um, my seminary professor said that that was unbalanced and not worthy of the cause. Great. Knock yourself out. You rewrite it, build a ministry on your own, on your own principles. And I'm not saying that to be sarcastic. I'm saying that to say that there is a measure of there is a measure of arbitrariness to this to, to, to these principles. But not quite as arbitrary as you might think. There's some extraordinarily well thought out wisdom that's contained in setting these three three things out. Why were these three things set out? Well, I got to ask that question to the person who started to put this together years ago. And he helped me out with a very helpful chart here. In dealing with the principles. First. The beauty of the principles is, is that they have a Trinitarian echo. Who are the people of the Trinity? Who are the people of the Trinity? Trinity. Alright. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We recognize that there is an ontological uh, Trinity, right? Somebody define for me the ontological Trinity. What is the Trinity in its being, its essence? Catechism. What do we mean? Where's the seminary students? What's the ontological trinity? This is a, this is a presbytery exam question. And I'm going to ask it to you. Come to presbytery if you're a good or day. Same in substance, equal in power and glory. In other words, the ontological trinity sort of talks about the essential unity of the three persons of the Godhead. Right? Now, for a kicker, what is the economic trinity? How do we state that? This is the Father and the Son. A lot of begetting going on. A lot of proceeded. Nobody knows the Father begets the Son. The Spirit proceeds from the Son. There it is. The Father is the fountain of all being. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. Right? And the Spirit proceedeth from the Father and the Son. It's the economic trinity. Seminary students over here. Those girls are kind of going like, are they done? Are we done with this? Um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Next, what does that mean? It begins from this point to help us to ask certain questions. Um, I believe that from the Trinitarian view of this, you can start with some concepts that are fundamental to each member of the Trinity. In other words, the members of the Trinity don't do the same thing. And for the sake of discussion, I'm going to suggest that from the Father, we get a sense of authority. From the Son, we get a sense of the mission of redemption, the work of redemption, the, the covenant of redemption made between the Father and the Son before the foundation of the earth. And from the Holy Spirit, we get a uh, we get a sense. What's the word that I used? Yes, we get a sense of true human freedom, freedom of the Spirit. Right. In other words, in the economic trinity, when we see what the, what the members of the trinity do, the, the functions that they exercise, we see that the Father establishes the fountainhood of all, fountain of all authority. You know? Nothing happens that my Father doesn't want to happen, Jesus says. It's all from His hand. Um, every good and perfect gift comes from above. The Father of lights, Paul says. The Son lives to sort of work out eternal redemption, both from before the foundations of the earth, we find out from the prophets, but also actually in time, by taking on flesh, he works out the process of redemption. He still is working out that process because he's seated at the right hand of God the Father right now, interceding to the Father on your behalf. Finally, the Spirit is the active agent of the Trinity. In other words, when something gets done inside your soul, it's because the Spirit did it, right? The Spirit was at work. I felt convicted. I felt drawn to the gospel because it was the Spirit at work. And what is He doing? He's making me into be a true human being created in God's image. Because that image has been marred. Not lost, but it's been marred. And so there's a restoration that's going so that I can be who I really am. The freedom to be truly human. Follow this? So, if that's true, and you and I are created in this God's image, 
about that. I just threw you a curveball. If we are created in the image of a God who is in possession of this economic reality, does that not also mean that there will be questions that will be pressing upon the human soul? Question number one will be the struggle for truth. What is truth? Better question for your generation of high school students. Where is truth? I think less and less people are saying, I don't think there is truth. But every time that comes up in our generation, it only takes a few years for that to get the beat down. Finally, atheists are starting to get hit upside the head. Because uh, there's a big revival with the Dawkins, uh, Christopher, what's his name? Uh, the Hitchens uh, movement. But, one, but the, the tide is now turning. Once again, it is never last long. There is no truth. Not that truth. It just doesn't last long. So truth, though, will continue to press up on me. Now the question is, where is the truth? Where is it located? Where can we find it? How can I know it? It's a fundamental question. Everyone's asking for that. Parents function as a surrogate authority for people in your age group. It's important. It's one of the reasons why when that relationship breaks down, that's why there's trouble. That's why you have a job. Question two. What do I do about my guilt. If there is a work of redemption, if, if, think about this for a second. History is what it is because God is working out redemption for His people. If that is true, does that not mean that every single one of your students is trying to work out problems with guilt? I, I'm an old, you know, Freudian on this one when it comes to dealing with people's issues. Somewhere down there, you are trying, junior high student, to resolve the fact that you know there's a God. And you know that you're on His bad side. That is what your behavior is. Your behavior is a result of that ultimate inner conflict. Now, it works itself out in a billion different ways. But when it really comes down to it, you're trying to figure out how can I be right with God. That's what you want to know. Romans 1 assures me that despite all of your bravado, Despite all the fact that you've got the popular life that you sold your soul to in junior high. Despite that you were the coolest, you breezed through, you know, the high school, and everybody just thinks you're the cutest, funniest, you know, most athletic, whatever. Even despite all that, this every bit of it is an extension of being on the inside. You don't know that you're right with God. That you're on his outside. Thirdly, the third great question with which people struggle is questions of change. How can I stop being who I am? I'll be honest to you. Be honest with you. One of the great problems we're we'll talking about just a second is most high school students wrestle with this before they wrestle with this. This is all we've been trying to say um, in RYM and RUF for the last 10 years. And I'm tired of getting beat up for it. All we're saying is when you begin to ask this question, because here's the funny thing. High school students will ask this question. This one feels kind of irrelevant. But they'll ask this question. I don't like this about me. Ladies, you're especially skilled at this. My girls do not like who they are. They don't like what they look like when they look in the mirror. And no wonder, because we lie to them with Photoshop. Every day in every magazine and every TV show they watch. Lies. All lies. And camera angles. So they want to know, they want to know, how can I change this? Even if it's how do I change my body? Which is the most fundamental question. How can I not be so awkward? Awkward is the new scarlet letter. You know this? It's no longer adultery. The worst thing can be said of you in high school is not that you're an adulteress, it's not that you're gay. The best thing can be said to you about, it, about you these days. Awkward. It's the scariest thing. How can I change? How can I be more confident? How can I connect sort of with people in different ways? This is, uh, these are fundamental questions that I believe are rooted in the fact that we're created in the image of a God who is like this. So now you see where I'm going with this. The answers to these questions, fundamental questions of, of truth, are answered in Scripture. Where is truth? It's in the Bible. So I've got to do some work to let you know that this is more than just a book. It's not like any other book. It's different. When you read it, it works on you. You're not working on it. It's working on you. It's weird. It's different. I'll that in a second. 
Secondly, justification. What do I do with my guilt? You cannot imagine what God is going to do with your guilt. You're not going to believe it when I tell you what God's going to do with your guilt. Because this is nuts. Because right now, God is your enemy. He's got a gun pointed at your forehead to judge you for all time. Here's the crazy thing in justification. God points the gun on Himself. He turns the gun of judgment on you and He turns it to Himself. That's crazy. That's like the, that's like the, box, the jack in the box that pops out the end. Bing, what? That's like going along in a story and suddenly the story turns in a direction you're going, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Everybody's saved. These are the movies that make you cry. Right? That make you weep because there's that moment in the story where it turns and you're caught up with true joy. And that's why you weep the good movies. It's why I sat like a two-year-old watching The Cruise. The Cruise. Did anyone see The Cruise? <gasps> you're all wrong and awful. You have to see. You're in youth ministry. How did you not see The Cruise? You have to see every Disney and Pixar movie that's put out. That's obligatory. Go. Ah. I'm ashamed for all. The Croods is fantastic. The Croods has this wonderful scene where the family is marching out across, you know, headed for tomorrow. That's where we want to go. Has somebody seen it? Have you seen it? I thought you said the Croods, like Tom Cruise. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you guys are killing me here. Do they have movie theaters in your town? <laughs> the Croods. <laughs> Disney is a, a DreamWorks uh, movie. Uh, Nicholas Cage is the voice, and uh, Emma, Emma, no, 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 Stone, Emma Stone is the voice of the girl. It's a daddy-daughter movie. So daddies with daughters, brace yourselves, okay? There's this wonderful scene where the father is intimidated the entire time by the daughter's new boyfriend, because he's so cool, he's so creative, he's so great. And he bumbles along, worried that he's sort of part of another time. He wants yesterday, he wants safety. His theme for his family is always be afraid. What do we say in our family? Always be afraid, Daddy. And so they go on, but now they're going to try to go on and march for tomorrow because they can't, uh, they can't live in the world in which they're in. And so they finally march up to the very precipice of tomorrow, and they can't see whether there's something over there. And so they have to have an act of faith where they, the dad throws them across the canyon. And all of a sudden, we, I'm going to start crying to tell this story. All of a sudden, they get to the end of it, and the daughter realizes what the deal is, because only the father can throw everybody across the great chasm into the safety on the other side, and then he's going to be left. And there's, extraordinary, there's this extraordinary moment where the, the daughter looks up and goes, no, 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 you can't do this. I, I've got to fix this. I've got to make this right. And I, I, I just, I came undone. Because I heard the voice of both of my daughters, perfectionism coming out. Be like, no, 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 I can fix my life. I can take care of this. It doesn't mean that there'll ever be sadness between us. But the father takes her and says, no, this is the only way. And he takes his daughter and sends her on across the safe side. So the father starts sitting there alone. Here's your ball and crying. Thinking the father finally had to do the great act and then die. I remember thinking, it's a little dark for a you know, cartoon. Um, but what happens? At the last minute, the creature that we thought was great, the greatest danger to the family as they went through their journey, pops out and decides that it doesn't want to die either. It begins to participate with the Father the last minute, the very last second, to jump over to save them. Oh, who would have thought that? Look, oh, it's just a little story. But in that moment, it catches you up in joy. It catches you up. Why? Because the story of human history is being told you're living it. It's what human history is. It's a story of Jesus working throughout history, building his kingdom. So when all of a sudden Hollywood catches glimmers of that story in Christ, they do it all the time. Yeah, they'll wrap it a bunch of foul filth or whatever stuff that you've got to filter out and not watch it because it's inappropriate. There are other times where they pick it up and you just go, Whoosh. why does that make me weak? Why do I feel alive when I hit that? Because you've got in touch with what the doctrine of justification says is it's going to turn and God is going to declare you righteous on the basis of His holy work. Look, folks, that's, that's just nuts. That's nuts and awesome. And then finally, how do I change? 
sanctification answers that question. How can I change? Well, it turns out that the same grace that saves me grows me up in Christ. That the more that I learn about that identity that's been established for me, the more I can go and struggle. In other words, it's a shock to find out that my job is not necessarily that I struggle with sin. It's not that I'm trying to be free from sin. It's that something has been done in justification that makes me free to struggle. Does it matter how many times I say that? And every one of you going to be like, you know, the folks are all like, I don't think that you should struggle with sin. Hmm. Weird much. I said it. There are forces struggle. We're asking about the context of your struggle. Are you struggling? Here's the question. Take, uh, take Christian as he does makes his, uh, uh, his uh, journey to the celestial city. And he has to go through the slew of despond. And uh, uh, Spurgeon was actually one of the guys that was critical of the way in which Bunyan had portrayed Christian going through the slew of despond. And someone said, what, Spurgeon, what could you possibly be critical of? To which Spurgeon responded, honestly, I thought it would have been a whole lot easier to go through the slew of despond without that huge weight on his back. What did most Spurgeon say? He was saying that the grace of God in the gospel is the thing that gives me the ability to struggle to the nines with my sin, to extend any effort, to look at my hand and say, if this causes me to sin, it would be better for me to cut it off than to enter into, enter into, uh, to enter into the substance and stand for the judge sin. It gives me the freedom to be able to make those kind of decisions. Justification having to be in the proper order. Uh, what Mark Lowry said for years is 95% um, of the issues with which your high school students wrestle will eventually trace themselves back to a misunderstanding of justification and sanctification. That sound overblown to you? Your students on each occasion, either at any given time, are trying to put their sanctification in front of their justification. Like I was talking about a minute ago. Hey, we want to talk about change, but we don't think that change has anything to do with this guilt. Oh, yes it does. Until you deal with this, this ain't going to happen. Our justification has got to come first. Acceptance comes. Right standing has to become before right acting. That's foundation. And at right acting is not an option. These are your two students' two problems. Either they're trying to get sanctification in front of their justification, they're trying to do enough good stuff, change enough so that me and God can be on the same page. Or they looked and said, well, I'm a Christian. Whatever, God's going to forgive me. And they're neglecting the fact that God wants to purify. God wants to change. God wants to make you into a true human being. We are convinced at RYM that these three fundamental principles of um, ministry are so foundational, so um, direction setting, that a student can begin the process of building on that through the rest of the Westminster Confession of Faith through those three things. That's where we are. So that's our deal with the principles. All right, it is time for a break. Let's take a break. And then uh, have questions right after that on some of this material. Can we do that? So cook up some questions so we don't have to power through that awkward silence. Uh, when somebody says questions, questions. Follow where we are. We started with uh, theology leads to philosophy leads to methodology. We talked about what philosophy was yesterday. Today we talked about what our theology was. And we broke it down. Westminster Confession. We narrowed that down to the principles of Scripture, justification, and sanctification. Less. Why are those three and why aren't others? Well, here it is, because there's a Trinitarian bent to those principles that make them useful. Like I said, there's probably other organizing concepts uh, for talking about some of these things. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you, I've actually done my own uh, that, I, that I would redo some of these over. But this is what RYM has sort of blocked into, and it's really good and it's really helpful because of what it teaches you about pastoring. Okay? But do y'all have any questions about this? Joey also asked me in addition to doing the, uh, uh, the Pentagon, he wants me to uh, uh, spend some time on the, the principles, what they are and why they are what they are. I'm going to do that for like 10 minutes here in just a second. Well, are you about to discuss practically how it looks 
I think that is a pharisaical reading of that story. It's true, and we mentioned that, of course, but there's something else going on. Because when Jesus goes up to be baptized, in the verses right prior to that, by John the Baptist, he looks over at John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is freaking out. He's like, wait a minute. You're the one who's supposed to be baptizing me. And you want me to baptize you? What does Jesus say? John, suffice it for now. In order to what? Fulfill all righteousness. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, John, please don't hinder me in this. I'm trying to establish a perfect record for my people. I'm trying to live the life that they know they're supposed to live. That's why Jesus is so strident in His commands about not just being pure in action, but being pure in heart. Don't just do external good things, but do it from a genuine heart. And yes, we look at that and say, oh, to strive for that. And we do everything we can to strive for it. But we can't do it if the knowledge of that is hanging over us that if you don't, then you're rejected. That is not the gospel. And it's not good news. The gospel flips that on its head and says, I accept worthless people who will own their worthlessness in the act of faith and repentance. That's who I accept. And when that gets accepted, suddenly you and I are married. This is not a loose bond. The sort of... The, the, here we go. Back to the... Back to the... What do young people sort of wrestle with? Over and over again, I get students when they talk about their spiritual lives who I get the sense feel like the bond that exists between them and Jesus is a very fragile truce. You know, okay, like he's all right with you now, but you better, you better watch it. Because you know, one more indiscretion like that, and I can't say where you are spiritually. Look, all I'm saying is, is the gospel comes along and says, being precedes doing. If you're into grammar, <clears throat> the indicative always precedes the imperative. And it's got to be in that order. Does that help with the justification and sanctification thing? Yes. So say, if you'll quit talking, then I'll say yes. That's what we do. 
I don't think that's untrue. And that's all I did for you know, 17 years in campus ministry until that day. But there was a difference in framing what I really thought about their issues and helping the conversation go in a direction that eventually terminated in one of these. Now, you didn't hear me just say, every conversation you have eventually has to be talking about one of these. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that when you become to get these, you can now take a step back. And this is the way with the principles are a diagnostic. And say, how well do I feel like my students are wrestling with the issue of truth? Is there a respect among my youth group that the Bible is different? And that they really ought to read their Bibles and study their Bibles? And that coming to Bible study is the best way to create spiritual change in their lives? And that the best way to do evangelism to their friends is to invite their friends to youth group? Why? Because this is a freight train, the Word of God. And all i got to do is get you in front of it. They don't have to believe it. This is hilarious. I love uh, um, <sighs> Perimeter Atlanta. Pastor Rainbow. Rainbow. Rainbow is a fantastic illustration of this. He goes, I'm always cracked up by people who come to me and say, um, we well, you know, how can I evangelize my friends when they don't believe the Bible? You know, that's all scripture, scripture. And they don't believe the Bible. I don't believe your scripture. And he said, that's a really funny illustration from within Christian belief about scripture. He said, imagine for a second that I decide that, you know, with Brian, I'm done with him. He's just on the front row, I'm done with him. So I'm coming at him with a dagger. Got a knife in my hand, I'm ready to take him out. So I walk up, and Brian looks at me and is like, oh, he's horrified. <laughs> Hope you'd be horrified. The speaker has a knife. Um, actually, he looks at me first and he goes, what do do? What's that in your hand? It's a knife. I'm going to kill you. It's a little bit of a vile illustration. <laughs> um, and then Brian looked, looked at me and then said, oh, thank goodness. I don't believe in knives. Now, what would I say in response to that statement? I would say, hmm, well, I would say the efficacy of the knife is not dependent upon whether you believe in it or not. See, the efficacy of the knife is sort of in this sharp, sharp point part right here. All right? That's where, that's where the action happens. So when the Bible looks and says, when Paul, John, uh, Paul says in Romans 1, you know, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Notice, that verse did not say that the Gospel talks about the power of God. It says it is the power of God. You don't have to breathe life into the Bible for it to do stuff. God says, my word goes after me and it never returns to me void. It always accomplishes what I wanted to send out. So, the best evangelism that we can possibly do is to bring people in front of that. Right? Who cares if they don't believe it? You better be careful. The longer you sit in front of it, It'll start to work you over. Now, there's a whole discussion on saying, yeah, but what if they harden it? Well, sometimes the Scripture does that too. I'll bring up that topic. Okay? So that's, that's a way of getting fish. There's no way to spell Scripture. That's for sure. Um, but that's a way in which I begin to stop and think about Scripture becoming an issue with my students. Are they growing to love and appreciate the Word? Do they feel like they can defend the Word? You know, don't think that in high school your students are not getting beat up about being like, I don't know. I mean, I just how do you know the Bible wasn't written by a bunch of medieval monks and uh, they just made all stuff up? I love that the sort of uh, ignorant speculation. I don't mean ignorant of this. It's just you're completely unaware. Like we know that medieval monks didn't write. We got, <laughs> got papyri from the first century, so it excludes the monks from here. There's never been a historian ever who thought about this until your freshman year of high school. Where you're like, I don't know, I mean, but if the medieval monks might not. Well, they did. And we know that. Pretty well. So you've got to be the person that helps them along with that. Because that's the kind of speculation that they're getting. That's just the scripture one. Justification. Do I get the sense that there are people in my in my group that are lit up with freedom? Have they ever stopped? I'll say this. Um, my, my second daughter, Carolyn, came home from the Presbyterian Youth Retreat. And there was an RUF guy who was the speaker there. And it was really interesting. And she didn't have any words to talk about it necessarily. But she was like, Daddy, this morning the message at the church service was so good, I, I cried. I said, well, sweetheart, why did you cry? She goes, I don't know. He was talking this thing about the church, and about the, like, the church is kind of like a bride. 
I started thinking about it, and I, I don't know why I just kind of started crying. And she has no idea what's, what goes on. But I think somehow, I'm not saying she's converted or not, I don't know, but that's not where we're heading in this direction. But there was a glimpse that she got of maybe there's a beauty that God has for his people. That's a justification thing. Do I see that in my students? Sanctification. Um, do my students feel the pressing need for hope? I'll bet you they do, because the more frustrated you get, the more you talk about that. <laughs> and all the parents want to come and talk to you and be like, uh, I had someone say this to me the other day, I almost, my head almost exploded. They're like, well, you know, uh, there's, we feel like we've noticed a tendency. This guy was in his late 50s. And of course, he's much older than I am. Um, that, you rush up on that, uh, you rush up on those ages, don't you? Um, but he was like, well, I just feel like, you know, this generation, they're just, they're so much less grateful uh, than the previous generation. You know, when I was doing campus ministry you know, back in the 80s, you know, it seemed like there was much more of a spirit of gratitude. And I, I, I'll, he was an elder, and I couldn't be ugly about it, but I kind of wanted to be like, you have got to be kidding me. You're going to blame this on this generation? People today just aren't grateful. People today, good night. If I hear one more person be like, I mean, it is shocking how open we've come uh, to the homosexual agenda. And I'll be like, it's always been here, kids. I promise you, misshapen sexuality has been going on for a long time. Yeah. Cave drawings will show you that people have always been taking their sexuality and warping it. Why are we shocked? And why are we not looking for ways in which we minister to these people and try to express to them what life-giving sexuality looks like? Instead, we're always on the defensive. We're completely on the defensive now. Uh, politically speaking, this, this thing is not even a question. Do my students still get that language? Is there a sense in which that's being wrestled with them? Those are the kinds of evaluation questions I would point at in talking about Scripture, Justification, and Sanctification. The reason I like that question because it kind of did what I wanted to do here for this first part under the principles. Um, there's a story. I won't, I won't have you turn to it because we're running out of time here. Um, there's a story that Jesus tells in Luke 16 of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember the story? And a child. It was the really only story that was like this hellfire and brimstone story. The rich man who's got a beggar named Lazarus who lays at his gate. The rich man, I love the old King James Version, um, fared sumptuously every day. Luke 16, 19, something. Um, and so he fared sumptuously. The two of them die on the same day. Uh, the, the Lazarus, the poor guy, is taken up to Abraham's side. Uh, and then uh, the rich man goes to Hades, where he's in torment. Well, there's this brief exchange between the rich man and Father Abraham about sort of the inevitability of this circumstance. Because he's kind of like, just send Lazarus over to dip his tongue. And Father Abraham's like, look, this is done. It's not, nobody comes back and forth across here. This is what happened. You had your good things in your life. You know, uh, and, and uh, Lazarus bad, and now he's comforted in your torment. That's 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 what happens when you make your life, when you build your life around yourself. You now have yourself. You got what it was that it was all coming for. But then I think the real point of the story gets to him because the the brother, for whatever reason, decides that he or the, or the rich man decides that he doesn't want his brothers to come here. I have five brothers <coughs> here that I don't want to come to this place of torment. You know. Could you send Lazarus? By the way, he's still ordering Lazarus around, which means that he hasn't like he's not like recouping uh, at this moment. Could you send Lazarus to my five brothers so that they can warn them? Do you remember what Father Abraham answers him with? What does he say? If they don't believe the prophets and the word of God, then how will they believe somebody from the dead? Well, the first thing that he says is he goes, "Hey, if Moses and the prophets, let them hear them." He kind of lays that out there. Now, by the way, Moses and the prophets, that would have been a New Testament ways person of speaking of the Old Testament scriptures, which was all that they would have had at that time when they said, that makes sense because New Testament still be written. Okay. So Moses and the prophets. Um, in other words, the answer Father Abraham gives to um, the rich man is, well, they have the Bible. Tell them to read the Bible. And, of course, the, the rich man is kind of like, oh, <laughs> you don't get it. Father Abraham, the way things work down here is we need proof. We need some evidence. So give me something that you got here. I, you know, to be honest with you, if Lazarus would just go back, 
The reason why I'd be kind of cool is because somebody rose from the dead. I mean, come on. If you get somebody who rises from the dead in front of you, I mean, they'll repent. They'll be all over. And Father Abraham. By the way, don't ever start a sentence like the rich man did. No, Father Abraham. Don't begin a sentence with that. <laughs> um, Father Abraham is like, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convinced even if somebody should rise from the dead. Don't you think about that for a second. I guarantee you don't believe that. If I told you tomorrow morning is a special day online because it's going to be Miracle Working Wednesday. <laughs> miracle Working Wednesday. Is tomorrow Wednesday? Tomorrow's Wednesday. Miracle Working Wednesday. In this very room in the comments here, I'm going to perform some miracles. I'm going to levitate around the room. I'm going to uh, uh, produce uh, you know, objects out of thin air that weren't there before. And to really finish the show, I'm going to raise somebody from the dead. Now, what's funny is, you would think to yourself, he's crazy, he's insane, but there'd be a party that'd be like, but I'm going to that. I'm going to go watch that. In other words, you would think to yourself that some kind of special show of display of power would motivate you in this direction, don't you think? Your students think the exact same thing. Now, like if someone would just show me, if I could really know, if you would give me something a little better than just your lesson, is he still barking? What? Are we going to do the Bible study now? You ever notice the delight with which they have on their face when you say, you know what? We're just going to play games tonight. <gasps> right? We can wait for it. <laughs> yes, what games are we play? Don't want to do that. What's up with that? We think that what God has done for us is he's not given us enough evidence. That's what we think. My wife and I, Ginger, were flipping through stations years ago. It was one of those Discovery channels, you know, like, mysteries of the Bible, which are horrible shows. Um, but, but I can't not pass over. You know, it's just one of those, as a minister, you're like, we got to stop. And Ginger's like, great. It's going to be in a bad mood in about 30 seconds. So they had this atheist guy that someone, someone was interviewing. The interviewer, I thought, asked a really interesting question. He said, so what if you're wrong? As an avowed atheist, what if you die and you go to heaven? Like, what are you going to say to God? It's like an EE -E question to an atheist. Atheist did not even but didn't even hesitate. He goes, oh, I'll look at him and say, you didn't give me enough evidence to believe in you. Oh, and the spirit of the rich man lives on, is it not? Every time someone says, God, it's on you, you're hiding. Why is God hiding? Why all the cloak and dagger? Why all the invisibility? Just make yourself obvious, God. Show up, God. Well, here's the crazy thing. Father Abraham looks and says, you know what? If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, they ain't going to believe even if somebody rises from the dead. <clears throat> okay, Jesus is telling the story, so who's he talking about rising from the dead? Himself. Uh, Himself. Good, good. Just follow along with the story. Um, Jesus is saying, I'm going to rise from the dead. And guess what? People still aren't going to believe. Now, there ought to be something inside of you that's like, huh. So, miracle working Wednesday is not going to work. That's not going to build my faith. This is my problem with the entire Pentecostal movement. Is there is a fundamental assumption in that thing of ministry that says, when I see the miraculous outpouring of the Spirit, people will be moved to believe more. No, it's just the opposite. Actually, it doesn't work that way at all. A foolish and adulterous generation seeks a sign, Jesus says. You know, it's funny. He, do, he will never perform his miracles as tricks. And by the way, his, his miracles were not meant to be tricks. Don't preach them as that. Don't sit with your students and be like, that's amazing. 5,000 people with just some loaves and fish. We took one lunch and fed all these people. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Go believe in it. That's not the point of the story. Because honestly, I can think of a whole lot better miracles that Jesus could have done. You ever thought about this? I don't think this is blasphemous. I don't think. <laughs> so I'm driving home. I might have a change of heart on this. I could have done some better miracles if I was why didn't Jesus, and I'm not, I'm honestly not being silly here, why didn't Jesus sort of fly around Palestine? You know, and kind of come in here and have the sort of powder smoke sort of come out, and then for him to look and say, Alright, y'all see that storm over there? Everybody watching? Here we go. Roll it. You know, peace be still. And boom, it was still. I mean, the, the story of the Bible is cool. It's awesome. But only you know, 12 people got to see it. Um, maybe we should have had a bigger audience, you know? 
Now, granted, he had a lot of crowds, but why not just like, you know, fly off to Rome and confront the emperor straight up? I am king. I am God now. Now, you're all going to say, you're being ridiculous. It's not a superhero. Okay, well, but here's my question. Was he able to come that way? Of course he was. Of course he could have. You know, he could have called 10,000 angels, um, uh, he says, to the Roman guard. Or to Peter, whoever it was. I can call 10,000 angels in that party. He's going, why did you do it? It would have been awesome. He was going to blow the whole thing away. But it's because Jesus' miracles were not meant to convince. Jesus' miracles were performed to show us what kind of kingdom he was bringing. He came to do a miracle of healing people because the ministry of the church is to go and heal people, oftentimes physically, every time spiritually. He came to sort of open up deaf ears that couldn't hear because oftentimes physically we're supposed to be doing that. All the times spiritually we're doing that. This is the kind of kingdom I'm bringing. Read those miracles and those like they completely change the story. But we still have one last question. But I want the Steven Spielberg special effects. It would still be cool. I mean, God, if you healed this kid from his cancer, and he's a committed Christian in my youth group, the rest of the town would have to acknowledge that he was faithful. I mean, it would be a revival in this town, God, if you would do this miracle of saving this person, and the doctors have no idea how it happened. Now hear me, of course we're going to pray. Of course we're going to ask for God to do something that we don't understand in the life of someone. Of course we do that. But listen, it won't work. If you drove away tomorrow after a miracle working Wednesday and I had raised someone from the dead, the most you could drive away saying would be like, well, what I saw was something I don't understand. But that's all I saw. Most of you would walk away being like, I got to sleep. Go ahead, dead. Because it's a suspended animation. I don't know how the trick happened. You'd be working to explain it away. You want to know why? Because you're not objective. And yet we somehow think that my little presentation, if it's just a little bit too cool, cool if it's cool, is going to uh, convince someone. No, they will not be convinced if they don't hear Moses and the prophets. Whatever I do has got to be about the Bible. We need to open up the Bible. I don't have to breathe life into it. Let that little dagger do its thing. Fang. Fang. Chicken wing. Bird sign. What are we talking about? Alright. Any questions about that? Scripture doesn't get changed. Alright, let me do this last section here. And uh, again, this is the overview. Let me redraw all this. Now, um, you're okay if we lose this part. Last thing is is uh, do this now. So just thought of one more thing I wanted to do. Um, last idea with principles. The principles end up becoming for us the center of our work foundational aspect of our work. And what people have struggled with over the years is the role that the principles play in the rest of the ministry. And we use the tree illustration. If I'm not mistaken, we've got that drawing somewhere. Does that make it anywhere in the tree in there? Someone put that thing down over there. If not, I'll keep at it. What do we mean? How do the, script, how, how do the principles function? In our ministry, it functions in the same way that a tree, a tree functions um, uh, in ministry. That is, scripture, justification, and sanctification become the foundation of what we do. And we're hoping that this foundation creates fruit, growth in grace, evangelism and missions, fellowship and service, and the development of a Christian world and life view. That's the fruit that we're looking for. But what happens oftentimes in youth groups is they get very excited about a certain fruit. There are ministries that are all about the growth and grace thing. You kind of go through a bit of a phase where you're like, you know what? No one does a personal devotional anymore. That's ridiculous. We need to do personal devotions. We are doing personal devotions. 
and they suddenly get excited about this fruit. An appropriate fruit. A good fruit to get excited about. It should be five or five times. You better believe it. They better. The question is the means by which we seek that fruit. In RYM, we're saying that the nurturing of the principles is what's going to create good fruit, not by focusing on the fruit. Or else it's not a fruit. This is the fruit of the Spirit that creates these things, not the, not the, uh, the ends of the Spirit. It comes, from, it comes from the principles being applied. Let's do another drawing. Let me help uh, illustrate this. Rocket. Rocket in there anywhere? The rocket, the trees, yes. Complete made. This is coming closer, Roy, to your question, I think. This is what made me think. This is a rocket. The rocket has justification, sanctification, and scripture on it. This is the thrust of our ministry. The thrust of our ministry is just we major in these things. It's the sort of stuff that we sort of find ourselves using to categorize. The temptation in ministry is always, though, to get diverted to what we call um, ethical or even theological tangents. Ethical tangents. Things that we consider uh, to be tangents or results of this ministry and not true to the ministry itself. What are these kinds of things? How about homeschooling? I want you to be thinking of some. What happens if we build our youth group on homeschooling? No, this is a homeschooling youth group. All the parents here decide that we're going to functionally do our ministry to the students who are homeschooled. We believe that's an ethical tangent. It's okay to have opinions about these things, but it's not central to who we are. Does that make sense? We have opinions, but it doesn't become the kind of stuff that I lay my name down the chopping block for. Um, dating versus courting. This was a fun one. What are you working on in your youth group these days? Honestly, we're trying to introduce the idea of courting. Okay. It's interesting. You know, we don't want them to date anymore. It's too destructive. It's bad for them. Ethical tangents. Um, so, are we going to have Halloween as a favor? Or Reformation Day? <laughs> um, no, we're not going to celebrate Satan's birthday this year. We're going to have an event at the church because we realized that Halloween would be the one day a year where we would actually talk to our neighbors. We don't want to do that. So, we're going to stay at the church. I don't have an opinion on Halloween or Reformation Day, and I'll do one. Um, finally, finally, my church has put their Reformation Day celebration on a different day other than Halloween. Thank you. Now you're understanding what we're saying. Um, okay, music. What are y'all doing this semester? Well, we're focusing on all of the rock music. Got a guy coming in to talk about how dangerous music can be. Somebody find about this thing wrong. I'm going to give a list of just Christian music. Okay. Good, good Chris. Chris Tom. Chris Tom. Yeah. No, no opinions. Okay? That's an ethical tangent, though, from the thrust of ministry. Alright? But there's just as many theological tangents. So here's where it gets kind of personal. What would be a theological tangent? What's a battle that you don't think is worth fighting among your youth group? Put up for you. church a few years ago, 
basically works night and day to get Bethel Baptist not to insist that uh, Presbyterians rebat or get rebaptized if they were baptized as children. It's a big deal. I'm not saying it was great, Piper's awesome because of it. That's just an interesting statement because what he basically said was, is we're not going to put this on the, in, in the realm of the stumbling block. We have our beliefs, we have our sincere appreciation for it, but we're not going to stick it out there somewhere um, to die over. Controversial. What else you got? Say again? That's the following. Yeah, yeah. End times. Yeah, you'll get excited if you read one of those books and kind of be like, weird. Reform people don't always talk about, you know, Jesus is coming back because of the latest stuff in the Middle East. It's faded a lot since the year 2000. It's amazing how much history repeats itself. What's the other one? Oh, yeah. Ooh. This one's a big deal. Uh, creation uh, versus evolution. Look, this one doesn't go away. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, in college, it, it, it's the last straw. Uh, once they get that, they're laughed out of the classroom from it. If you have opinions about that, you better believe it. You've got all kinds of opinions. But when it comes down to it, the main thrust of what I'm doing are these central concepts. How about the um, uh, worship style? You know, our church would be great if we just find something that we can do better in our, in our worship services. Now that may be true, but that suddenly can become what our ministry is about, can't it? It can suddenly become what the church is about. What's the main, I've had this conversation multiple times, what's the main shtick of your church? What's the main draw? Traditional worship. We're the traditional worship people. Oh, there you go. That, that, Interesting definition of self. Again, see how easy it is to allow these various things to sort of distract you from who you You did not hear me say or express opinions about these various things. What we're saying is, is what role do they play in your ministry? Look at this. Kevin, you mentioned it, and suddenly Kevin produces pictures of the tree and the rocket for everybody. I heard about theirs. You're, you're like, have to get this. You're like, our Girl Friday. That's right. Give up a big hand. So okay. Any questions about that? Before we finish off on that? I want to do Rocket Tree. I was asked to do the Rocket Tree as well. Yes. How do you not sound like... Your voice sounds better. How do you not sound like a... You're just gone. You're going to have a conversation about the worship style. 
I mean, I love youth group because we have guitars, but when I go to the services, it's that morning I'm just bored, I go to sleep. The way a youth group person hasn't said that to you yet. My daughter said it every week. Um, and I want to say I've got an opinion about that, but this creates a posture that is how your ministry is building out from your central convictions. Does that make sense? That's, good. That's all I'm trying to get at you. Let me give you a more practical experience of this. Um, on multiple occasions, I would have Roman Catholics come to me on the campus of the University of Memphis, uh, at, at, at Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, and ask me about either dating a Roman Catholic, maybe they were a Roman Catholic and wanted to fight about it, just whatever it's deal was. Now, Catholicism and Protestantism, Protestant from the word protest, protest what? Protest uh, Catholics. Um, you know, that's a pretty big divide. It's been around for a few hundred years here. Uh, lots of stuff we can talk about. So it is very easy in a conversation with somebody from your youth group who has a Catholic friend to get that Catholic kid to say, well, I don't pray to Mary. Because they're at your youth group, they're on your youth retreat. And they go, well, I, I don't pray to Mary. That's not what I do. They may or may not. It's just a lack of Catholic. Who knows? But in all of those discussions, the thing that helped me the most was sitting down and I said, look, you and I could probably talk for days about whether or not Catholics worship Mary or venerate Mary. I said, I gotta be honest, I'm not smart enough to have an opinion on that. I just don't actually do kind of opinion on it. But for that situation, not, not for them. Uh, but what I would say was, but I will say, Ken, would you mind if I directed what I think are the three big things we need to talk about? In a Catholic church, where, do we, where does truth come from? In a Catholic church, how does somebody be right with God? In a Catholic church, how does somebody change? In every single one of those conversations, I've never got off the first one. Because once you say, well, you know, if, a Catholic, if a Catholic person looks at me and says, well, we say the Bible is too. Actually, you don't say that. You say the church is the final authority. That is what you say. Look at there to give you a self-conscious one. I had one guy, man, this little Greek deli, who for two hours would be going round around about this. And he was so confident because he was so tired of the vacillating, the Protestant dividing church. So he was headed back to Rome, maybe, um, where I could finally get certainty. I was like, dude, thank you, man. The longer you stay in the thing, I'm afraid you're just going to be disillusioned because the councils and the popes have erred I'll never forget his response. His response, well, not when they were speaking ex cathedra. And I'm like, you don't see the circularity of that? Like, well, he's a brainy med school student. I mean, one smarter guy I've ever met. But you don't see that circularity? Come on. You either center on scripture. But all I'm saying is, it's a fairly you know, esoteric conversation. But I knew where I wanted to start it. And the crazy thing was, is he was okay with it too. And so are your students. In other words, if someone comes up and gives me a presenting issue, you know I had a big fight with my parents because they're racist, they won't let me listen to rap. I'll have a conversation about that. It's a great end conversation. As a youth director, you better be talking about the stuff that's important to them. And because they got a big set of Dre beats for Christmas, their music is always they're always plugged in. My daughter got a set of Dre beats. They're awesome. I like to borrow them. <laughs> they're, they're except they're red. I can't wear a pair of red. That's where I draw the line. Music is, music is a way. I'm okay with that. But my hopes are that a discussion about music begins to work its way around to here. I'm not talking about in a wooden way. I just mean I would like for my daughters to not just listen to music, but I would like to get them to think about why their soul is reacting the way that it is to their music. Music sort of developed a life of mind for me, it developed a, my imagination. But no one ever challenged me on where that imagination was taking me. And I'm not talking about, you know, thinking about sex and drugs and rebellion. It's not where it was taking me. It was taking me to a lot of self-grandizing, self-congratulating worlds where I would imagine myself up performing in front of me. Anybody else have this daydream? All the, all, the, all the maniacs out there can relate with me. But the fun part of listening to certain songs was like, what I wouldn't give for the fantasy of being in, in some stage with a thrust, you know, stage right out of the middle of it. 
with an electric guitar. And then I know how to play electric guitar. <laughs> And just got to hit that first beat, you know, watch the whole place sort of go crazy. It's amazing how often. We know nobody ever talked to me like, well, that's an interesting fantasy lesson. Let's go with there for a little bit. Therapist boy. What does that say about your personality? What does that say about that? See what I'm saying? And somewhere in there, I knew that there's a scripture justification, sanctification thing that I'm going through. Why? Because I'm trading the image of God. And I'm always going to struggle with authority, redemption, and freedom. I mean, I don't get no, I don't have to get to that in a conversation. Please don't be that wooden. Les was telling us we always get to talk about Scripture and I've only got five minutes left, so we've got to stop whatever you're talking about. No, it's a way of directing these kind of things. You're, you're asking a really good question, a really difficult question. But there's a nuance to this that once this kind of gets baked into your imagination, it begins to look more like terminal points in ministry where I can look back and say, man, I am proud of him. Because his filter on his computer helped him with his pornography. Sanctification. And he did it from the heart because he doesn't want to destroy that. Sometimes when he talks, he's talking about not wanting to destroy his conscience over it. Ah, yes. Does that make sense? So this, all, it, it becomes the very warp and woof of what you're doing. It's a great question. Well, that too. Any other thoughts? Let me finish this last section here. And then we'll have Q&A for the last half hour here. Theology leads to philosophy, which leads to methodology. Start uh, philosophy, start abbreviating here. Leads to methodology. What do we mean? What do we mean by methodology? Well, in the broadest sense, RYM is going to say to you that we believe in an inherently flexible methodology. In other words, we, we, we try to say broadly that when it comes to the way in which you work out ministry in your context with all of the variables considered, when it comes to that, you have inherent flexibility. But the situations are different. RIM to the frustration of many youth pastors does not come and give you a pre-designed youth ministry calendar full of events, full of um, uh, you know a, a map for things. What we try to do is to take a step back from that and say, what is the role large group plays in your ministry? What's the role that small groups play? Take in all these things in consideration and pull together a plan that is true for your church. And to be perfect, every year you come back to ROI and rework it. That's why you got to keep coming back here. It's not just to sell the conference. It's because you need it. That's part of this network building. So in the, in the same way that broadly speaking, we say that our theology is based upon the Westminster Confession. Broadly speaking, our methodology is inherently flexible. But we can say something more specific about that. Specifically, we express our methodology in our presuppositions. Uh, somebody said to me years ago that the real central um, thrust of RU, uh, of RUS philosophy and ministry, and for that reason RYM, is found in the principles and the presuppositions. I talk about principles and presuppositions the most whenever we're doing training because they tend to be the things that people grasp uh, the most vividly. We had a lot of work in the presuppositions last year, I remember. Uh, and so I'm going to go through these very quickly. But I, wanted to, I want you to know where we, where we place the presuppositions. By presuppositions, we mean the mode in which you do ministry. The manner in which you do ministry. We list six ways that create a posture, mode, manner, posture of you when you stand before your youth group, when you go to that lunchroom to visit those students, when you're sitting in the stands of that basketball or football game hanging out. There, are, there is a posture that is created by presuppositions that keeps you from hurting people. And I, I don't want to be overly dramatic when I say this, but 
for so many students that have come through the halls of youth ministry, it is well in the realm of possibility that church could be a dangerous thing for them. In its most absurd form, it is uh, child molestation charges that seem to rally around church situations, or at least get the most press. In the subtle forms, there are subtle forms of condescension that are taught and owned and embraced, oftentimes by church uh, context and by pastors who are well-meaning but trying to justify their own existence <laughs> and end up wearing people out. Burnout is often worse when they finally arrive at college from their time in youth group than is sort of uh, cluelessness. It's worse to get burned from a situation. The presuppositions establish the mode of your ministry. And by establishing the mode of your ministry, it creates a posture so that you don't hurt the people you're being called to help. Okay? Again, there's a whole lot more on that that I could talk about, but let's dive into it because we don't have a whole lot of time. And Joe is going to do one of the one of the ones. Um, he's going to do one of these six. So let's start with our first one. What are the presuppositions? Number one, we say a biblical slash reform theology. Presupposition number one is that we build ourselves upon an inherently reformed expression of theological commitment. In other words, in the same way that we build our ministry theological in the Westminster Confession of Faith, it also functions as a presupposition. Now, you ought to be thinking to yourself, well, that's how does a commitment to a theology that's distinctly reformed, how does that keep from destroying people? Ah, glad you asked that question in that way, because it means you're understanding the presuppositions. He said repeat what he wishes they would think. Reformed theology it protects people because you lay your cards on the table. To confess to people that what you are about is the Bible is a grace to them. It helps them know that you are not approaching the text that you're studying or the issue with which you're talking about from some point of assumed neutrality. It is bad for people when you say, well, you know what? Uh, the Baptists are in the Baptists, Presbyterian and Presbyterian, Episcopals and Episcopals, uh, Methodists do their thing, but the truth is, we just believe the Bible. Um, okay. We appreciate that, and there's a sense in which that is true, that the Bible trumps and stands in uh, judgment over all those denominational expressions. But I'll be honest with you, for every student that has expressed that concern about what is this reform thing? I would call it reformed youth ministry. It's like, what is reform? For every student that I have walked through the steps and said, look, I can give you a very general answer. The theology that came out of the Reformation. Reform. Reformation. That's where it comes from. We are generic Protestantism. I think I've said that phrase a million times to students. We're just generic Protestants. That's who we are. It's amazing how often a student will express some relief. Ah, okay, all right. So we know what I'm dealing with. In other words, it's not helping us in this generation of students not to take a side. We thought taking a side was going to marginalize us. And we're finding the exact opposite is true. Take a stinking side. <laughs> Even if I disagree with you, at least I'll know where we stand. Look, and, I, and I'm going to be all threatening about this by giving us one of those sort of dark predictions. Let's just, let's just get all dark here for a second. Um, why is Europe converting to Islam in shocking numbers? Europe is typically about 50 years away from us. At least it used to be that way um, before uh, social media and the internet began to sort of do the things that it does in speeding up social movements. Um, but Europeans long left any kind of sense of cultural um, conviction as it pertains to truth claims. Okay? So why is it suddenly now that someone who clearly violates the human rights of women, 
who increasingly has violence that follows around their fringe history, um, that posits an absolutely monotheistic, deterministic view of God, who offers the strictest of um, uh, duty and religious performance in the five you know, acts, five, with five pillars, why in the world is that suddenly taking over in Europe now? In droves! So that even France has to pass some kind of law against a burqa. It's that big a deal in Europe. It's being overtaken by Islam. Why in the world did that happen? I think it's because of this. I think that because the great problem with secularism is not the fear that people will believe nothing. This is Alan Bloom, the closing of the American mind in the mid-80s, who was like, oh, we're all relativists. People don't believe anything. That is not what we ought to be afraid of, even though that's been bad enough. In the absence of real conviction, the real fear is that people will believe anything. You know what it typically is? It's the loudest voice. And Islam is a loud voice. They are a convicted voice. Remember the planes hit the, the towers in 9-11? Remember how often it was that people got on the airport and said, you over here reporting on about the cowards that came and ran this plane, these planes into these towers? And I remember thinking, hmm, I know what you mean when you use that word, but I wouldn't use the word cowardice for that. They're diabolical. But that's an act of absolute faith in something evil. But that's not cowardice. That's conviction. And the real disturbing part was how many people in our nation looked at those people as if they were heroes? Although I don't think that would happen much with the 9-11 bombers. But I'll, I'll bet you that Timothy McVeigh guy who bombed the uh, Oklahoma City uh, uh, federal building. I'm going to tell you right now, remember how he died? Remember his last quote that he gave to the media before he was executed in 97, 98, whatever it was? I have kept, I, I'm the master of my domain, I'm the captain of the ship. I'm still, I'm still not ready. I've given up my life for to fight against the tyranny that's over me. So I'm going to take all these lives with me. Look, all I'm saying is, y'all, in the absence of having some, uh, taking a side, They'll be drawn to the next voice. It does not help us to be like, just leave this theology thing. That's just dividing people. Oh, we got the divisions. And it's not because we, it's not because we're still talking about it. It's because we decided it wasn't worth talking about. It. Because we said, hey, we gotta get people to accept Jesus. Let's just spend all the time talking about theology. Oops. Looks like that's controversial from the looks on your faces. Y'all are grimacing. That's awesome. Number two is a presupposition of the church. Joey asked me not to do this one because he's going to focus on the idea of the church as a presupposition. How does the church keep me from hurting people? It's a good question. Number three, the other presupposition we talked about is focusing on the individual. This is a big one. There are two things that we, we intend by this presupposition of focusing on the individual. When you focus on the individual, you pay attention to two issues. Number one, you pay attention to the diversity inherent in your student body. We resist the idea that there is a magical ministry tool. Oh, a magical ministry tool. The worst imitation of Magical history tour. Where's the Beatles? Over? Nowhere near as good as the Beatles on Sunday night in the Grammys. Did you see Paul McCartney? Sound awesome. And he was playing the piano from the Magical Mystery Tour. They found it in LA and brought it to the stage at the Grammys. Did people watch the Grammys? It's pop culture, it's what you're showing the soup. I have a little bit of it. Anyway. Um, we don't believe that there is a magical ministry tool. Right? Magical ministry tool. The MMT. That you put immature student A into, through, and out comes mature student B. It just works every time. 
By saying that we focus on the individual, what we mean by that is we respect and honor the fact that what worked for one person may not work for another. And therefore, I want to honor that fact in them and own that <clears throat> I may have to do something differently with this kid. You know what? I asked all my big questions to Neil, but it wasn't until I got into an ice cream that the kid cracked like a, you know, like an egg. Huh. Who'd have thought it? Who'd have thought that he needed emotional transference? Remember all that? So there's respecting the diversity of the students, the first thing that means. The second thing that means is, is there's a role that you play in that student's life that is more of a mentor than it is a buddy. This bears saying on a regular basis because it is very easy for your church to want young people to be youth leaders and directors. And oftentimes, there are times when students will want you to cross over into just being their buddy and not a mentor. When we focus on the individual, we remember that there are roles that we take on as pastors to students. We want them to confide in us, but we also want them to uh, respect us as well. And if you're out there, you know, I think of a youth director who got in trouble one time. Um, you know, it, 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 it's like clockwork. Don't show a rated R movie on the bus coming back from the ski trip. Like, don't do that. Don't be that person. You're going to get in trouble. Don't be the one who, in the heat of the moment, decides that you're going to go out and use the restroom in the woods, you know, with the other kids or something like that. There was a guy who was on a raft trip, and he decided that he would go to the bathroom upstream, and it's like, did you think the kids were going to talk about that? And not one week later, he's sitting in front of the session. I'd like to explain that. I'm have fun. How fun would that be? <laughs> Sorry. A lot of enjoyment out of that. All right. Fourth presupposition. This is a big one. Demographics. Fix. Um, I'm going to do a little name drop here. This is too much fun. Uh, two weeks ago, I got to be in New York. And uh, for an evening, we did this big fundraiser that Tim Keller came and spoke at. And so I grabbed him for a little bit. Uh, to get him to say on video what he said at General Assembly last summer about RUF, which was really nice. Um, and uh, so I kind of dragged him out. We were there at Central Presbyterian Church, uh, which is an EPC church in New York, right at the park at 60 or something around the third. Um, beautiful, beautiful building built by uh, Rockefeller. Uh, it was, it was uh, Fosdick's first church before he goes up on the Upper West Side to uh, uh, Riverside Church. Anyway, so we're having this fundraiser at this big banquet hall and everything. Um, I was like, Tim, is there a way that you can go down to this video? He was like, sure, sure, sure. Let's go to this office. Well, as we go to this office, he said, you know, this office is really cool because this is the place where the so-and-so girls used to meet. I was like, who are the so-and-so girls? He was like, well, there was this club in New York back in the 30s and 40s and 50s that used to be full of women who were performing on Broadway. And they were there kind of talking about advancement and something, and you became a something-something girl. I can't remember the name. Um, he's like, you know, Barbara Stanwyck was a something-something girl. Just amazing people have been in this room. <laughs> because I'm sitting there fumbling with my camera equipment. You're trying to listen to him, and he said Barbara Stanwyck. And all I want to say is like, well, I used to watch Big Valley as a kid. Nobody <laughs> knows I mean, what Big Valley is. It's an old, oh, yeah. Good night. Do, you, do you people have a television? Do they, it's, a, it's a box, you know, that the pictures come out of? Anyway. This was what was so fascinating, is when I told somebody that story, uh, I told the pastor of the church that story, he's like, yeah, that's very funny. You're not going to find anybody who knows New York better than Tim Keller. Once he finishes writing books for ministry, he'll be able to write books on New York City. He is a student of New York. And he spends his weekends, when he gets time off, where he'll find a book, read it about a certain section of New York. There's no end of the books about sections. And then he'll go and walk through that, interview the people and talk to the folks. So that now, after, what, 25 years of being there, he knows the city as well as he possibly could. You are to be a student of your context. And especially if you're new, if this is just your second year, please don't think that you figured it out. You are to be the person who knows that context. You know those teachers at that high school. You've met that principal. You know who the principal was before. You know what they're frustrated by. You know what the last youth director did. You've called him on the phone and talked to him. You've actually talked to the youth director before that. 
You've met with, um, you've followed that kid around for what he does after school. You know what the latchkey kids are doing in your context. You know the breakdown between men and women. You know the breakdown between age of who's older and who's younger. Demographical research helps become the very skeleton of your ministry. And what it does is it keeps you from wearing your people out. There's nothing like a demographic study where you're kind of like, where you beat your students up because they are racists. There are no African Americans in this group. You beat them up. Well, all it takes is a little demographic study to find out that there's no African American school from within 10 miles of your church. There's something to that effect. And I realize I've been stressing these people out over something that's not immediately at their fingertips. It's a random example. But you knowing what the demographic of your school, of your youth group is, will help you in projecting good ministry to them. Demographics protect people. They protect you. They keep you from being frustrated as well. It's a like to be at that school for that kid. It's 9% of their time. All right, fifth, almost done, two more. Uh, we talked about something called the learning process. You use a little, uh, a little, uh, what do you call it, acronym? T D O E E. This is straight out of InterVarsity's uh, philosophy of ministry from the 60s. Um, the learning process, what we recognize is, is that people come to own truth in different ways. And the ways in which I can communicate that truth and see them own it, or learn it, I've got to be aware of. What does the T stand for in the learning process? T is for? Teach. There's a part to that. Of course, I've got to stand up and teach. One of your big problems is, is now that you're out of seminary, you think that's 95% of what you do. Nope. Not that much. It's a big part. It's an essential part. Make the whole deal. D, you also have to demonstrate that truth. Are you allowing your students into places where they can see you act in the way in which people ought to act? So, well, yes, they see me all evening on Wednesday night for a youth program. No, it doesn't count. Do they get to come into the house? Do they get to go with you on your errand that you run? How are you inviting that student in your life? To me, this is where Young Life has done a great service to the church. Uh, I'm critical of Young Life and some other areas, but on this one, they've done a good service because they constantly say, if you're going to run an errand, take a kid. If you're going to the grocery store to Walmart, take a kid. Find a way to enfold them into your life. Why? Because they need to have the Christian life demonstrated to them. And if there's a little part of you that's kind of going, ooh, I don't know if they want to get in the car with me because, like, sometimes I get road rage. No, no. They need to see the Christian life demonstrated, which means your repentance over your road rage. They need to see that. Be like, wow, you're a real human being. It's a fantastic old story by uh, uh, Larry Crabb. Uh, psychotherapist, sort of Christian version of it all. Um, Crabb tells this story in one of his books about seeing a guy for about six months in a therapeutic situation. And then he saw the guy uh, years later at a conference. And the guy comes up to him and says, um, um, Hey, I just want you to know, Dr. Crabb, that you, know, you saw me as a client you know, about 10 years ago. It was really helpful. And Crabb was like, Oh, yes, of course I remember you. Yeah. And Crabb was like, Would you mind if I asked you sort of a personal question? Um, uh, what was helpful about our time together? You said that I helped you. Can you remember what I said or what it was that was that moved you? And he was like, oh, um, yeah, um, mm, well, uh, I couldn't come up with anything. He could not remember one word that Crab had said. And so Crab kind of starts to get tickled with himself. He's kind of like, look, he goes, do you remember any interaction with me? He's like, well, there is one thing, but I don't think it's relevant. He goes, well, tell me. He said, well, there was this time about halfway through our therapy sessions that we were going through where I saw you at the grocery store. And I walked up to you, and you looked at me and said, hi, John, um, how are you doing? And I looked at you and I said, what do you mean, how are you doing? Do you mean, like, uh, how am I doing or, like, how are you doing? <laughs> See, he said, you looked at me and said, no, no, just how are you doing? He goes, oh, yeah, I'm doing fine. Just shopping, get some vegetables. <laughs> You know, kind of question one. And they sit and had a five minute conversation about the stuff that was in each other's basket. He said, That's all I remember from our interaction. 
Because suddenly he wasn't a, ther was a therapist anymore, he was a human being. He was connected to him. It's in the book, Connected, by the way. Okay, okay so demonstrate that. He was like, oh, what's the O stand for? Observe. Are you in there warm enough to watch it? Man, there's nothing greater than me than to sit on the side and watch my daughters. Um, Andrew doesn't care about getting all of the press. I've got a son named Luke who's nine who's awesome. Just, uh, uh, he doesn't get any press, though, yet. He's still fun. The teenagers are not going to work. Um, <laughs> but it's so much fun to get sit on the side lines of their lives and watch them interact with their friends. Um, there's a little bit of panic rush on the inside right? as you watch them. You're kind of going, oh. are they awkward? Are they socially awkward? Are they have a scarlet A. Um, are they having fun? It's interesting. Where are you putting yourself to watch students? Because if you don't observe where they are and what their life looks like, when was the last time you went to their home? Was the last time you went to their room? I know cross gender room going is inappropriate. You don't let your mind go there. But when's the last time you, you went into that little mayhem that is their home? And you felt the tension you could cut with the knife between those parents. And you felt the, the sort of a, a passive aggressive anger coming out of that child for their parents. Or whatever. Or you went to a happy home where you're going, I wish I could have grown up in a place like this. Their parents are awesome. To observe brings them to a learning process. And then finally, the E stands for evaluate and encourage. Mark Lowry, two years ago, at this very seminar, on this very day, two years ago, raised his hand and goes, Well, you got that wrong. Because I said, I said, encourage and evaluate. He was like, Oh, that's backwards. He said, Because if you're going to evaluate somebody, you need to finish with encouragement. Because if you do nothing but evaluate people, they'll wonder whether you really care about them. So that for every piece of evaluation that you give to somebody, you've got to give them 10 pieces of encouragement. Let me give you some constructive criticism. But I'm going to follow that by 10 pieces of the things that I love about you that are great. Because that's the way you work. I'll tell you right now, if you ask me to play back as many tapes as I've got of my memory of being in high school, I can't draw off the happy things people said about me. There, there's a pathology for you. There's the sinful part for you. My mind doesn't even retain the good things. It won't hear the good things inside of the soul. It'll hang on to those negative comments, boy, like tenaciously. And I can remember it like mathematical precision. You were aware of this, you were aware of that, and then you said this. Why does our heart do that? I've got sick people. <laughs> Alright, last one. God is at work. This is a big one. Save the last, save the best for last. The last presupposition that keeps you from harming people is that we trust in the fact that this is God at work. This is His work. This is not on you. I was sitting in the cafeteria at the University of Memphis 20 years ago. And uh, a young lady who was not involved in our ministry came in completely devastated. She was bawling, crying. And I sat down. I was like, whoa, Kimberly, what's going on? What's going on? There were actually two or three of her friend girls standing around her. I said, what in the world's going on? She, she barely talks. I just went, well, it's a class. Okay, calm down. She's a code. It's a, uh, it's a conversation. Well, she had been in class her freshman year in Memphis. And um, the professor had said something sort of against Christianity. And it was ugly and sarcastic. Well, she took it upon herself. It's like, you know what? This is my time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a stand for Christ. Here I go. And she stood up and she was like, well, I think, blah, blah, blah. It says something to the effect of the Bible this and Jesus that. The guy sitting next to her, literally the whole time, is like, you have got to be kidding me. You honestly really believe that blah, blah, blah. It just turns into like super jerk, right in front of her very eyes. So much so that the conversation not only went on in class, you can imagine a professor who let this stuff carry on, but after the class is over, the guy is still needling her in the lobby outside the classroom. That was just an emotionally abusive situation. And the guy who's walking off, obviously with some extra grind, laughing at her as he walks down the hall. Well, I mean, who wouldn't cry? I would be in public if somebody was that cruel. But she comes back, and in the midst of her sniffling and talking, and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, there's people like that, this is part of the deal. Jesus was like, don't expect people to applaud us, to consider it all joy, they're not attacking you, they're like, hey, blah, blah, blah. It's not working. Until I finally get to what the deal is. Because she said, that's not what I'm upset about. 
She says, what I'm upset about is, is what if that guy walks away and it's the last time he'll ever hear the gospel? If he goes to hell, it's my fault. Oh, <laughs> sorry. This is not a brokenness conversation here. We're having a self-righteousness conversation here. Honey, this ain't on you. If, if Think about what you just said. It was funny because she was like, I, that's not what I meant. I, but you said it. It came out. There is something on the inside of you that suddenly believes that God has rested the advancement of His kingdom on your shoulders. If He goes to hell, it's my fault. Oh. Look, this is not, God is at work as a presupposition. It's not a way of getting you off the hook. It's not what it is. It's a way of keeping you in the game. Because whatever failures you can catalog for me from the fall of 2013, you're lying to yourself if they're not failures. Stuff you wish you did better and well. Whatever list you can, someone's got to keep you in the game. The idea that God is at work keeps me in and saying, you know what? He can even take my feeble efforts and turn it into something that actually is this way. Turn it into something that actually is God's son. It's going to change. Presuppositions of RYM uh, for your perusal. Um, what does all this mean? It means that our philosophy of ministry is our operating system. Think about this. Um, my phone, uh -huh. I think it's a fantastic device. I I'm still enamored. I'm still enamored. You know what this thing can do? It can do anything. What it can do is it can give me four text messages from someone. Um, give me all kinds of information. Now, what's the difference? There's three different things that are working here. There's, first of all, the hardware, right? That is this uh, hard uh, glass on the outside called Gorilla Glass. It's part plastic, part glass. It's one of the Apple's great inventions. Uh, it's got a particular back. It's got a camera here. It's got hardware. It's got a microphone. It does its deal. It also has, when you open it up, it has a bunch of apps, okay? Applications that are written inside of the uh, of the phone that I can press on. I can look and say, mm, um, "What is what is my email doing right now?" I can press it, and I have 20 new emails in the last three hours. That's always a peachy for me. Um, they never stop the emails. But an application. But here's the question: There's a third thing that we don't often always see, and that is the application cannot run on the hardware unless you have an operating system. The operating system are the set of rules, the set of assumptions, the set of parameters, the set of uh, environments that are created in which the apps can move. What's the illustration? Your church is the hardware. It's your sense of place. It's your location. The apps are the programs that you're putting together even as we speak. In your mind, you're thinking, this guy is right. I've got to be better at going to kids' lunches. I'm going to do better this semester at going to at least one lunch at the local high school uh, three times a week or something. I'm going to have that program. That's an app. R RYM's philosophy of ministry is your operating system. It's the set of assumptions. It's the set of um, uh, parameters and values that give you a place for your apps to run. I love that illustration. I think it's very helpful. You may disagree, but you would be wrong. So, all right. Any questions? We're going to come to the Q&A time here. Um, yeah, it's 20 minutes to, to lunch, so if you got to go to the rest of it, go ahead and go. But we're going to have Q&A for anybody that wants to stick around and cover any of the stuff we talked about last yesterday or today. Yes. A lot of what I've done here recently um, is a really strong uh, youth director center ministry. In other words, you're going a lot of places and things in the house, being in school, and getting them off the air and so forth. How does that um, merge that back into the church? Rather than saying like youth group is a sub church within our church, the presupposition of the church is going to do just that. That's why this is a little bit uh, truncated. 
because that's such a huge question that uh, Joey asked if he could sort of tackle that. So I'm, I'm, it's not just pure cowardice, that there's a little bit of cowardice <laughs> that I'm deferring on that one. Um, but it's obviously an issue. It's obviously a question of saying, how does this make in? I'll say this, though. For, um, for guys that I've known, in the 20 years of RUF, I've seen a lot of guys go out to local churches. Um, that they work with the, the principles, the presuppositions are what have become their, have worked away their DNA. The, the, the principles that they're down with, they're good, but they'll always want to tweak them because it's kind of theological. But this is something I think is still true in every context. Because again, it's, it's about the posture that I'm taking when I approach people. And I think it's not just true whenever I'm talking to high school age or college age. I think it's true when I'm dealing with my session. Every one of these things sort of screams about our identity, uh, about our focus on community and this body life, about dealing with them as individuals, and our, my role with that session. You don't think you've had any role confusion with your session? Demographics, all that work still continues to play a more important role. Jim, I, I think this is a challenge for us all, because we have to That has its place. We didn't just go for the weekend 
on this rafting trip. Let me tell you how that rafting trip fits in with what we're trying to do as a whole. Because I put together a ministry plan that sort of was extended out of a fairly sophisticated way of looking at ministry. So that's kind of what happens. But again, it's, and there'll be more seminars in the week to come. Today is foundational day. Y'all are doing what you want to do. You're going, okay, put the pieces together for it. And in the sense in which we always go, no, that's on you. We're giving you the parameters, the operating system. Now it's time for you to write the apps. And we'll see if it runs in the operating system the next year when you come back. I love that math illustration. I hope that's working for y'all. I have a, I don't have a cell phone. All right, go ahead. Did that help, Jim? Did that help? Yeah. Follow up with this other question we have Okay. Keep at it. We'll, we'll go to it. Uh, you see, I, I think I remember from last year and um, from seminary, but are, are we incorporating still the family systems, or is, is that what Joe's going to do? If you also put that into the church, and is that what he's going to do? As a presupposition, yeah. Um, that may very well be where he goes with that. The importance of a family social system. That's probably why he asked that. He had some specific curriculum he wanted to go through that I'm not familiar with yet. Okay. Uh, and I was thrilled to let him do something special he's developed. Okay. So, yeah, let's see if he does. Yeah? How do you respond to criticism that comes from some that youth ministry will segregate and separate students from the means of grace and sanctification of the church? Yeah. I mean, that's a regular, that's a perennial. That's been around since I was in high school and junior high. Um, you know, you sort of section these folks off. There's no question that our commitment to the church, as a presupposition, ought to say, I'm looking for ways, if any, that I can help bake people into the larger life of this church. My people need to have greater exposure to um, all age ranges. It's important for this youth person to know a single mother who's trying to make ends meet. It's important for this person, the youth, to know someone who is facing the end of their time. I remember uh, one of my really good friends in ministry, when he was 25 years old, was doing a pastoral visit to a guy who was 85 years old. Here we go. Um, I thought this was both funny and tragic and weird and bizarre and awesome at the same time. But he was sitting with him. And eventually the man started talking about his eventual death. 85 years old, you know? He did what he wanted to talk about. And so my friend kind of sat there, and it wasn't weird. He was trying to be a good pastor. And he was giving him some feedback, and he was like, man, he goes, I guess. He goes, I guess you think about death a good death. Is that true? He said, I'll never forget. This 85 year old man, Jackson passed away from now, leans over to him and says, Son, I think about death as much as you think about sex. <laughs> it's a hilarious thing to say. Because for my friend who was 26, 27 years old at the time, he was like, oh. <laughs> 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 much. Um, but, but, but what did that do to his worldview? When you speak with an elderly person, he thinks about death as much as we think about it. Isn't that fascinating that someone would be preoccupied? Yeah, my, this last year has been fairly rough. I, I lost my dad uh, this uh, last summer, July 4th, after sort of a six year battle with lung disease. How about dealing with lung disease in the way that I want to go? Dad was, I think, braver than most. Um, but there's a, there's a life vertigo that you get when you lose a parent. Like you suddenly kind of, you feel very strangely untethered in life. Um, I don't think that you ever get a chance to really experience that. Unless there's the great tragedy, you know, someone got killed in a car accident last week, so we're going to have this thing and deal with death. But maybe if it was sort of baked into the life of the church, it would be a bit more problem. It's interesting, I'm, I'm the youngest of three children, and my dad was 74 when he passed away this summer. Um, and so my kids are now having to deal with this at a much earlier age. I was old when I got married. I was 28 when I got married. Uh, didn't have kids until I was 32. Uh, there was a sense in which uh, it's been weird. Because I'm worried about it. You know, because granddaddy passed away. And so did grandpa, too. My wife lost her dad nine months to the day before my dad passed away. So 
My house has been just death uh, for a while. But I'll say this. I think it's important for my kids to know. I think they've been baked into something that they've got to see. Because in the old days, death was nowhere near as antiseptic as it is now. You realize this? That like, I got a phone call from my mother that my dad had finally passed away at 4 a.m. in the hospital after this long extended thing been in the corner for a week or so. Um, and then I, I never saw him again until the funeral, until the viewing of the body, which looked like a man. It didn't matter. Whoever did the thing, it was horrible. So I'm like, what? This is a big thing like that. Um, but in the old days, all of that stuff used to be done like on your kitchen table. You know this, don't you? Like the mortician came to your house to deal with you know, the person who deceased. Uh, that's got to affect somebody. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm answering your question saying to broaden the inevitable myopia of of teenagerhood has got to be on my list of things that I want to make into my youth. It has to be. But, but know that the inertia is pulling it that way because of the radical insecurity of that age. The kids are cruel as a crow. I'm amazed at the jump that gets, that gets said between my daughters at school. That's unbelievable kind of stuff comes out of their mouths towards each other. Of course, I mean, horribly insecure to so so that, 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 that my hobby is just keep from noticing anybody else. You're going to deal with the church as a presupposition, correct? I'm covering church and family. That's right. Good. That answers, uh, that answers John's question. I think that answers that question. I said that you were going to be covering that with me. So that'll be much more full discussion. Now I'm covering your one. Never mind. We're not going to talk about any of that this week. It's all up to you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm for you too. I skipped over the church stuff. Well, I didn't. I just talked about it the last 10 minutes. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Or thoughts? Notice I didn't say. If there's no other questions, we'll bring. Does anybody take a question? I like to know you were talking about how you use that illustration is A diagnostic. Yeah, a diagnostic. Are there other things you can point to that we could like build into maybe a system uh, of a quarterly report on such a chart? It's just a plain like chain. They don't think we're just off and like do three things or measuring specific things. Yeah, yeah. Are you an engineer by chance? Art director. <laughs> art director. I love that. The art director is branched out looking for systems of a. Uh, you know, to, be, to make something tangible. I'll say this: this would be a great, uh, this would be a great addition to the notebook. Somebody write a youth group report uh, template that would go to your session on a regular basis to let them know how you see the youth group doing. That'd be interesting. I mean, I got to fill out reports for every campus visit that I do. I go to a campus, I got to do a long report that I can do the next day after just to tell, keep the higher ups knowing what's going on. I heard about this. John Stone knowing what's going on. <laughs> so, um, but again, that's part, of the, that's part of the deal. How rarely do we love the idea of reporting? There ought to be some way. I'll say this the value of that, if uh, you want to talk about the, the session not condescending to you, give them a set of your goals. And the instrument by which you're going to measure whether you arrive at those goals, I'm sure that ever happens. A few youth groups ever do that. Now, you may not want that because you don't even know what the scrutiny is. But it'd be a great way, who asked the question about how you have to your here? Uh, it might be a great way to help impose the values of your youth group on the session without being appreciated. Look, I've developed this system here that I'm going to put together that I think will be helpful for you all because it has to do with our goals, it's kind of what I want to accomplish. Sort of in keeping with these particular areas. Well, guess what? Those questions that you formulate are going to come out of some of the operating system of thinking that you're doing from RYM. That's an interesting little addition. So, why do that? It's good to me. Well, Good job as an 
You, you, you're pressing, you're pressing the button. I, I, I give anything for Stone to be here right now, but this is his. His head would explode, but his head explodes a lot. Your thoughts about stuff like this. Not only are you right, but I think that there's a huge allergy that ministry in general has to the idea of any kind of performance expectation for our job. Why? There's a couple reasons. Number one, because ministry is inherently. Uh, an ambiguous job description. We want you to go work with the youth. And you're like, okay, I'm going to go work with the youth. Good luck. What does that mean? <laughs> what are the ways in which I'm going to be evaluated? You realize how hard it is to live in a world where you don't know the terms of how you're going to be evaluated? Or whether or not you did a good job? That ambiguity, that, that ambiguity is, is hard. It's difficult. It can frustrate you. You can get angry really quickly. You can get set off. You can get alienated from a session like that because you didn't realize that was pulling you into the service. I couldn't agree with you anymore. And I'll speak very strongly uh, to this whole thing. The second reason is, is we live in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pastoral context. And it's partly our fault because we've said, we've we called it the ministry. We know everything was great, but the Lord just called it the ministry. What other vocation do we put the definite article in front of? Why are we the ministry? Um, why are we so high-minded to think of something special? Nobody says, well, I just feel a call to go into the accounting. The accounting? Go to the accounting. <laughs> but we think we're so high-minded that we project to people that this is totally different. Ministry is totally different from your job as your business man. Yes. But we have a worldwide view that says there may be insights that we can glean from other areas that might be helpful for us to understand. Oh, like supporting your infrastructure. I work in a denomination who is allergic to talking about infrastructure. We don't pay for our general assembly. What we do is, is we hire some people to go out and raise the money from the churches that are already tapped out. Far be it that we've ever, ever looked and say, well, I'll tell you what, if we're going to come to General Assembly, you have to demonstrate that your church actually gave to the Askings. Yes, I'm expressing my opinion on how that vote went a few years ago. <laughs> that we lost when our denomination said, you yeah, know, we're just not going to pay for infrastructure. Uh, go raise it. All right, thank you for that. But you just put all your missionaries on the road. That's what you just did. For every home assignment that missionary comes home for, he is on the road. You come tell me what that did to that family in about 10 years. Why? Because the truth of the matter is, I just think it's top-down authority if they want to charge me a fee to head off to, to be a participant in General Assembly. That just nothing but gathers power in one central place. Wow, so we're still doing the reaction to the thing. Right? Same thing in your youth groups. It's the same deal. Um, I, how about this one? Why do you have to be poor to do your job? Tell me where it says in the Bible that if you're going to work as God, one of God's people, you will be poor. Now, we hope that you're an example to the rest of the world of not how to be a lover of money. We hope that. That's part of Christian maturity. But where does it say that the lawyer necessarily gets the giant house and you live the thing that's fallen down? Because that's, what we're, that's the pity that we're going to give you. You want to raise? Hey, you know where I come from? Ministers don't ask for raises. Oh, good. Christian, that's what holiness is? Great. Well, I'll tell you what happened. What it does is it takes folks like y'all who are gifted, talented, who can actually blow ministries up with influence, insight, and powerful ministry. And it makes you look kind of be like, I'm going to go work for Bank of America. Because I can like, eat with them. <laughs> See what I'm saying? It drives me insane. It drives me insane. And it's because it's the first time that I've ever really had to deal with budgets and stuff like that. Joey, what do you make for <laughs> What else you got? That's a good question and a bit of a button. Yeah, for a yeah. Related to that, but I think if, if that kind of form gets into the world, uh, I'm, thinking, uh, I'm thinking about the question from the session's perspective, and I think probably there's one of two reactions. One is this is the greatest thing because now we know how to, no session is doing this. It's not just about the people, they aren't doing it about anything. They're either going to respond very positively because now they have a tool they can then use across the church, or they're going to be very negative to it because they're scared. 
because they're not doing it. But the right. pastor might be scared because now he's going to do it. Look at what I'm doing. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, expect to get defensiveness from the other direction. Where someone's kind of like, uh, hey, we kind of like the enemy. Don't go sticking your nose in there. Hold attention. Because <laughs> that's the whole reason why I went to ministry. No one's going to say this to you. There's a lot of people that will be like, I went to ministry, some people would not pay attention to you. I'm, I'm happy with my you know, $35,000 a year salary. I'm not great with that. Just shut up. <laughs> you have a lot of fear. I'm telling you, Chris, it's crazy how many of my committees beg me for reports from campus ministry. Because they're there, and they know their role is to take responsibility over what's going on in that ministry. So how do you do that if you've got no data in front of you? If I come along and say, this guy's not doing his job, you know, we probably need to let him go. They're kind of like, well, who are you? i to get some time to throw you up and get that. Everything. But what's the criteria of, of doing that? Look, you have the power to set that criteria. You have the power to set that and say, this is how we're going to judge it. And even if the session is not important, Pastor is not on board or interested in that and doing it for yourself mm. is probably the most important thing they can do. Bring this up at your next staff meeting with your pastor. Don't uncork this on the session without checking with him. Just want to make sure because he may want to tweak it. And again, all the things that only in all end are to provide for these sort of template of kind of But it's not complicated. You know, this year I would like to spend no more than 10 hours a week doing Event planning. I want to spend 20 hours a week in one on one. Spend five hours a week uh, in administrative tasks. Something like that. Set a task where they get a sense of how you know that you've broken down time and that you're at least aware of it. Which the power there. That's a very good app application. I see too, like, someone who's frustrated by it, so once they can do the session, uh, there's not a lot of Set the posture for us by your Holy Spirit. Pray in Jesus' name.